What's good, folks? And welcome to another episode of the Cover One Film Room, the show that gives you the hows and the whys behind anything and everything dealing with the Buffalo Bills. I'm one of your two hosts this evening, Anthony Prohaska, joined as always by Eric Turner. And Eric, everything is beautiful in the Buffalo <laughs> Bills world. Going into the bye week strong, everyone's happy. It's good energy, it's good vibes. Man, just an absolute fantastic time to be covering this team. Like everybody is just in synergy with one another, <laughs> like from a like a take standpoint yes. and mentality and emotion. Lockstep, if, yes. if I may. <laughs> Lockstep. Well said. Well said. Uh Eric, we oh, we are venturing into the Buffalo Bills versus Philadelphia Eagles game film uh tonight. Offensively, defensively, we've got a bunch of advanced metrics. There's a lot mm. to unpack in mm -hmm. this episode. You know, you multiple times uh in talking to me, and then I know some social media stuff referred to it as a dense episode, and it yeah. most definitely is because there's a lot to unpack in both a celebratory manner, you know, with some of the stuff for the offense, but also from a detective work, uncovering some things on the defensive side of the ball. Um, and it leads us to kind of an important episode for this team, especially going into the bye and kind of setting the stage for what they need to correct going forward. If they want to not necessarily have to win out, but win out and push for the playoffs as they sit six and six right now. Yeah. Such a, a late time of the year for a bye. And, you know, I was talking to Adam, uh, one of our video coordinators and analytics guy today. And, it's funny because we're like, you know, it's nice to have this buy, especially against the teams you're about to face as, as you know, the Bills yeah. go forward. But it's almost to the point where, like, you wish you had that buy earlier to rectify some of the stuff that we're talking about tonight in the film room, specifically on the defensive side. Because the offensive side, I mean, the offense is humming at this point, mm -hmm. and Josh Allen is rolling right now. Um, we're going to we're gonna talk about that later in the show. We are going to kick off with the defensive side. But, um, yeah, it's, it's a bye week, and, uh, you know, we, we, there's a lot to cover. Uh, which is why we've been, you know, doing a lot of research the last couple of days. And and as Anthony said, you know, we not only have the film tonight, but we have some analytics and we're going to really take a deep dive into Sean McDermott's defense, especially when it comes to defensive adjustments and more importantly, late in the game, which the Bills, again, failed to um, kind of capitalize uh, on, on the scoreboard and at the end of the game. And of course, the defense letting letting the Eagles back into the game. And eventually winning it. So we are going to dive into all of that. So as I always say, you know, grab a beverage. This is going to be a, a deep dive into the defensive side of the ball. Yeah, it's funny how this, the way this game ended up transpiring, it almost became kind of like a microcosm for what this team has been on the year defensively, like not finishing games out in the fourth quarter and the second half, depending on kind of like what time range or frame you want to, uh, you know, use to kind of box them in a little bit. And, yeah, you know, they 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 played a tremendous game to start and really kind of took it to arguably the best team in football or one of the best teams in football in Philadelphia, you know, in their spot and almost slayed the dragon. But just those mistakes and lack of adjustments and some schematic pieces in addition to some individual pieces um, just really didn't click for the Bills in the second half. And it contributed to that loss, which, right. you know, again, has – Everybody all up in their feelings, uh, which, you know, right, you know, rightfully so. But yeah. Eric, let's let's start with the defensive side. And, you know, w w coming away from this game, going into the bye week, what are your high level thoughts, uh, you know, in regards to this game for the Bills defense? You know, where where's your head at? Is it one particular thing? Is it something large scale? Is it something related to this episode? You know, when you're giving your kind of like top down high level thoughts mm -hmm. when it comes to this Bills defense uh, coming out of this game, where are you at? I thought it was a good plan initially to start. It was a good plan. It was executed really well. I thought they did a really good job of rolling coverages to AJ Brown. It, it, it was apparent that they wanted to make sure there was, you know, two sets, three sets of eyes on AJ Brown, regardless of what he went in the second half. Not so much. Uh, the Eagles started pairing him next to Devontae mm -hmm. Smith a little more, which again, then you're in a, in a bind. Um, and when you talk about Jalen Hurts, and yes, he's been banged up a little bit this year, but in the first half, man, they did a phenomenal job of keeping him in the pocket and bottling him up for the most part. But again, in the second half, not so much. We'll get to that later. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I thought they did a good job. There were some cool wrinkles with some of their um, coverages, mm -hmm. um, some cover, you know, three buzz looks that were very murky, even from, you know, our vantage point with mm -hmm. the eye in the sky, uh, some cool little wrinkles and coverages there. Um, but it came down to, the coaching staff of the Eagles and the offensive side of the ball for them and their ability to adjust late in the game. And the bills just kept throwing out the same coverages and the same defenses while the Eagles made their adjustments and got some explosive plays 
got the quarterback outside of the pocket. And uh, that's really what it came down to. And so um, it, it was disappointing to see, especially when we talked about McDermott all year and all off season and how we wanted his style aggressive in nature, but more on the offensive mm -hmm. and, and able to adjust in game more so than, you know, Leslie Frazier being kind of that laid back type and just letting things come to the defense and relying on the personnel. It was disappointing to see how, little they adjusted to the Eagles offensive game plan. And especially when you juxtapose it with, with how strong they started out, like you said, like that whole, they were so sticky in coverage, whatever coverage they were running, like they're watching it on the broadcast, especially those first several drives. You saw like Hertz just hemmed in the pocket and like looking downfield and not really having anything. And although I do think he had some options early on that he just wasn't he hitting, it wasn't seeing like there were, yeah. So there, it wasn't like, Coverage was amazing start to finish, but mm -hmm. really in the beginning, they, they locked up pretty well against Brown and Devonta Smith. There were times where Hertz had nowhere to go. And then you pair that with that muddled rush and the individual execution that they had up front. They started out so strong and it's so disappointing to see some of those strengths and how they started out and juxtaposing it with that second half performance. And that's really where I'm at from a high level perspective. And I know we're going to break down a lot of it yeah. tonight, but just, I know this Eagles team, even going back to last year, like mm -hmm. they're a team that is known for their in-game adjustments or adjusting week to week 100%. and they'll spam the same look over and over again mm -hmm. if they know you're vulnerable somewhere and we saw it in this game on several runs in several aspects like they pinpointed a weakness and they were just able to attack um and it was disappointing to see the bills lack of adjusting or adjustments to the eagles adjustments and just kind of standing pad and almost letting the eagles willingly like dictate to them but eric like you got queued up here with some of the film like uh with that muddle rush the bills started out well like hurts looked uncomfortable he looked indecisive and they did a really good job with their rush lane integrity which is also something that they did not do well in the second half yeah i mean just look at it you know uh watch the edge guys they're compressing the width of that pocket and uh, Hertz does a good job of sliding around the pocket and there are guys open, but they're all down here. And the mm -hmm. spacing of the defense is really good. As I said, look, I mean, you got a triangle right over the top of AJ Brown there. Um, but because of the ability of the defensive line and the bills to contain him and then chase him uh, and force that incompletion, it, this is what I love. I mean, this is the first third down in the, in the first quarter, uh, they get the five Oh blocking man on man blocking. Cause you have Jordan, uh, sugar in the center here, Kelsey. And so they get the one-on-one, -on -one. but again, watch the edge guys and, and the angles they take to the quarterback. And again, compressing the width of the pocket. I mean, it's almost like a, that Petri dish that we always talk about with the, mm -hmm. the, uh, the offensive line, but they're doing it to bottle up hurts here. And as you saw from the all 22 angle, there were guys open, but because of the bills, you know, ability to get into the face and, and pressure eventually hurts there. He held onto the ball for a while, a while on this play. Um, this was definitely one of the, you know, uh, topics of conversation in the first half. They did a great job of bottling Hertz up and making him play quarterback from the pocket. Yeah, that's and that's the way to go. Like you, you have to try and make him one dimensional. And in an ideal world, you make him live and in the pocket and try and beat you that way. And if he does, you tip your cap. But they did so well to start out here. And like you said, like the edges controlling the width of the pocket. But then you've also got like Ed Oliver almost kind of acting as like a quasi spy a little mm -hmm. bit along the line. Like he makes contact with Dickerson, but he's not really fully rushing. He's almost like two gapping and spying, just like reading and wherever Hertz goes, he's going to go. Like it's kind of, uh, it was, I liked it and I likened it to kind of like a little, uh, a little wrinkle to their, which they've done a bunch this year, even going back to last year, like their three man rushes with a spy, you know, and just trying to kind of like add a little layer to, it. and it wasn't completely that, but just something different to try and again, pen hurts in, keep them in that pocket. Mm -hmm. And it was a good start to the game. It, it forced the three and out to start the drive and really made this Eagles offense inefficient and made hurts uncomfortable. Yeah, no doubt. And you can see it here. Now look at from the all 22 angle. And this is what I liked about what they did now watch the the pocket and how the the bills are playing on the eagles side of the line of scrimmage look at them compress the middle of that pocket and once again look at the edge players containing the width of that pocket playing with those outside hands and then you see hurts get outside the pocket but then you have the speed of floyd to flush him out to his right and the ball goes incomplete it just it was something that was so much more noticeable in the first half versus second half that pressure up the middle and how they were playing. I mean, Jordan Phillips, look at him. He just comes 100 yeah. miles an hour right down the middle of Jason Kelsey. And, D and Kelsey picks him up. But look at the pocket. Look at the muddiness now. And that's why Jalen Hurts wants to escape the pocket because he can't see the entire field 
with everybody in his face. He gets outside the pocket, and the ball goes incomplete. Yeah, and it's similar to kind of what we showed on that first play, like Ed Oliver works over the top, and he just comes cruising down that line mm -hmm. instead of getting too far upfield or crashing inside too much. Phillips, they almost like work a uh, – I don't think it's intentional, but almost works like a – twist like inside yeah. with Phillips because of how Phillips twists in. And it's a good job from Oliver reading what's happening. Yeah, playing knowing off each other, right? Exactly. Playing off each other and knowing what quarterback you're playing against, knowing what the objective is. And again, it's watching this like also sucks because it was such a good game plan to start the game. And it was so well individually executed um, across the defensive line. And really like we saw multiple reps in this game, or especially early on from Leonard Floyd and Ed Oliver, really just either winning individually and causing chaos and disruption in the backfield or showcasing their athleticism and flushing hurts from the pocket and we're kind of chasing him down to the sideline. Yeah. And I mean, this is third and 15 in the fourth quarter. So now Hertz is starting to use his legs to kind of break free, get outside the pocket to get a better look down the field. And this one was really just unfortunate in, in many ways. So third and 15, uh, you're going to see Epinesa loop inside. And of course, if a defensive end loops inside, that means the D tackle usually has to replace him as a contained mm -hmm. player. Well, Ed's not able to because of the good block by my, uh, my Lada. And, and then of course, now you get hurts outside the pocket. And this is really just a, like, let me give it a shot. It was like Josh Allen to Dawson Knox against the Patriots. Nice. Like that, you know, it's that type of play. Um, and they get the touchdown here. And so again, I don't know if this is a planned stunt or not. It looks like a planned stunt, mm -hmm. just the way that Epinesa kind of sets it up. But regardless, these guys have to play off each other. You just saw that last play. Ed Oliver did a good job of playing off each other. So if this isn't planned, Ed Oliver has to make sure he gets outside the pocket here or outside a shoulder of that tackle. He doesn't get driven inside. And that allows Hertz to escape the spot and then again just throw it down the field for the touchdown. This one was an absolute gut punch, just the way the ball floated up there. And Hyde is eyeballing it the whole way, but yeah. he gets like no hops to go up and try and make it. And I know like Zaki is kind of extending that arm a little bit, and the timing of it like interrupts. It looks like it interrupts Hyde's mm -hmm. jump as he tries to make a play on the ball. But it's third and 15. And yeah, like it's not really a it's not a complete prayer from hurts, but it kind of is like, he's yeah. just like, well, this is the only dude who can make a play. Let me try and toss it up. But up front is really, yeah, where it started. Like, and it, along with the systemic or schematic issues that there were in the second half for the defense, you also started to see like the lack of individual execution and, mm -hmm. or the individual players stepping up on the offensive line for the Eagles. Like I feel like in the second half, Cam Jurgens and Jason Kelsey and Jordan Maialata like really started to step up and dominate and win. And we were seeing schematic losses for the bills defense, but we were also seeing losses from an individual execution standpoint. And that's a good example there. Like they had contained, they had integrity in the first half and the more, we had the more we went along in the second half like that play just showed they started to lose that integrity lose that contain and it allowed Hertz to kind of lean into that creativity and his athleticism and once Hertz can do that you're in trouble yeah and here's another example of that and this is in the fourth quarter once again top of the fourth this time it's a third and fourth situation and Hertz is able to break the pocket and get 12 yards on this play and this is the play that Sean McDermott referenced in the press uh in the press conference after the game about how in the first um, earlier in the game, they ran man coverage. So you see man coverage across the board. And these two linebackers are basically reading off the running back. So whatever way the running back releases that linebackers pick him up, you see Gainwell come across the formation. Bernard takes him. So that means Dodson's the only underneath defender with man coverage to the bottom of the field. And this is where I said those adjustments happen because you have Smith and Brown into the boundary. All right. And so to the field, you have the passing strength. And that is why Taron Johnson's out there. So think about it. You have the Eagles, two best wide receivers into the short side of the field. And you don't really have one of your best pass, uh, you know, guys, uh, coverage guys in Taron Johnson. He's out to the field. And again, that's kind of typical. But mm -hmm. now you have Rasul Douglas against A.J. Brown. I'm cool with that. But then you have basically Mike Hyde versus Smith. You see him get turned around. But the pressure forces Hurts up into the pocket and he's able to break loose for the 12 yard gain. And Anthony, from the end zone angle, it's going to make you even more angry because watch what happens here. And, and when we're talking about rush lane integrity and everything, mm -hmm. watch what happens here. So you see pretty good rush right here. Um, you see Jordan Phillips kind of hanging back like you saw Ed Oliver mm -hmm. in the first half. Uh, a really nice rush off the edge from Floyd. And Jordan Jordan Phillips is reading J Jalen Hurts here and he sees Ken, you know Kenny Gainwell leaking out. So he kind of goes with him. But look what that does. I 
it opens everything up. And now you just have Dotson versus Hertz. And, you know, um, <laughs> and 12 then, yards. And, you know, <laughs> and dude, that that is what gets me more than anything is knowing, like, when I saw this even on the broadcast, I was like, of course he's in space against Tyrell Dodson. Of yeah. course. Like, why? I, and I don't know whether they did it on purpose. If they anticipated the man coverage call, and they leaked Gainwell out knowing, like, sweet, then you can put, like, Hurts one-on-one with Dodson. Like, I don't yeah. know if that's too galaxy brain or not, but it just makes me, oh, if this was Milano or even if it was Bernard, like, Bingo. maybe this play doesn't happen. Like, this Bingo. is where – some of the injuries start to creep up and who you have out there is starting to show a little bit. Cause I don't like the idea of Micah Hyde on Devonta Smith in the slot, especially as we've continued to show yeah. on tape this year where Micah Hyde has been beaten in the slot against like top level wide receivers, which isn't necessarily his fault. It's just a schematic piece. Yeah. But like that part bothers me, but it's also like the horses that they got just aren't necessarily there with the injuries they have. And when that happens, you have to almost course correct for that by being more sound schematically as mm -hmm. a team. And when you're not, it leads to even further breakdowns when you are short on that top tier talent at positions like they are here. And so Phillips, yeah, Phillips is like <laughs> not effort here, but like re what his result here pisses me off, but it's just more like, of course hurts is one-on-one -on -one in space for Stotson, and then Dotson just flails on his face. Yeah. And so, you know, again, McDermott talked about that play. They're in a man coverage. Well, everyone goes and is covers their guy. Then you get one on one with Hertz and Dodson. So he's he sees the same situation later in the game. This is an overtime. Three twenty nine left in the game. Thirty nine yard line. Third and three situation. The Eagles get eleven yards here, but this time again, same two by two set. L look where the wide receivers are. AJ Brown and Smith mm -hmm. up into the boundary. Uh, and, and again, Taron Johnson to the bottom. Uh, of the screen. So to the wide side of the field. And so the bills play quarters coverage. They McDermott said, Hey, you know what? We want to get all eyes on Hertz. He, he busted that run in, uh, earlier in the game. We want to play um, a zone coverage too bad. It was a soft zone coverage because mm -hmm. right here you see Devonte Smith just running an option route. He just hooks it up with, you know, the corner off safety off. And then you had Dotson splitting a difference here between um, the tackle and the slot receiver. And it's just, it's tough. It's tough for Rasul to trap this with AJ Brown uh, going vertical on him. Obviously, safety is not in there, but it's, it's mm -hmm. a tough read for also for Dotson. So it's just not ideal. You talked about Milano. It, it's obvious. You know, it's one of the things that we're going to talk about later is like mm -hmm. if Milano's here, he has a better understanding of how to run this coverage and he's more athletic and better in space. But it, of course, now you're, you're playing quarters coverage and you're getting that one on one with Devontae Smith against Dotson it's an easy pitch and catch for the offense and they get 11 yards. Yeah. And that flat area underneath, like it is one of the vulnerable spots in quarters coverage. Like even if you're a good quarters team, like mm -hmm. that's just a natural vulnerable spot. Like that area where Devonta Smith goes and works like that's a natural vulnerability, even more so when the apex defender is Tyrell Dodson. And I, it's unfortunate that, you know, we're showing two of these clips that are back to back for Dodson. Cause honestly, he's played well the past several weeks, well, yeah. especially against the run and especially given the expectation. Even in I this game, late too, yeah, like that, that, you know, he knocked the pass out against AJ Brown, which well, probably was a fumble, but uh, we won't get into that. But I'm saying, right? like, he did bounce back. Like, I know he takes a lot of, uh, a lot of grief from the yes. fans, but. Um, and yes, we are picking back to back plays here, yes. <laughs> but again, this is nothing against him, but to your point, man, if this is Milano, it, it's a different ball game. In fact, if this, if Milano's in this game, maybe they're not even calling this soft coverage. Mm, that's a good point too. Like they, it's, it's an unfortunate call in general, like, but especially with that personnel, the timing, all of it. And that's just, it's such an easy read for Devonta Smith. Like he comes out and senses the leverage right away. And then Dodson's doesn't have the juice to be able to get there. Like Dodson's mm -hmm. not going to be able to make that play. And it's especially on that third down right there, like third and three. I also, when this happened, I knew how many people were going to be upset because they're going to be like third and short and another soft yep. coverage. Here yeah. we go. It's Bengals Cincinnati repeat. all over. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yep. Like it's just an unfortunate way to get beat on third down. But you know, again, this is, the Eagles kind of understanding what alignments they can put the bills into given their personnel groupings and given the situation and where they can potentially win and the bills not adjusting and, or also being vulnerable because of, you know, where they are from a roster standpoint with yeah. the injuries they have on defense. Right. And keep this in mind. Cause I labeled it, you know, no Milano high EPA. This is one of the plays late in the game. So under two minutes and into overtime that McDermott calls this type of coverage calls, he gets a, a lot of these uh, type of looks against this coverage because 
um, of, again, the soft coverage and you're, you're putting a linebacker basically on a slot guy. But this is one of the highest EPA plays against a McDermott defense this year mm. when you're talking about, again, two minutes and under and into overtime. So just keep that in mind because it's something we're going to analyze later when we get into the uh, late struggles uh, on the defensive side of the ball. So on to the next play. Let's talk about this play. It happened early in the game. First quarter, 616 on the clock. Second and 12 situation, and the Eagles get a 12-yard gain. I want you to pay attention to, man, I'm st- this was not intended. I Tyrell know, Dotson. So bad. Tyrell Dotson <laughs> and A.J. Epinesa. I swear this was not intended. <laughs> um, so they motion A.J. Brown. They use that little Miami, you know, short burst out into the boundary, and it, mm. it gets Devontae Smith in the slot wide open. But watch uh, Epinesa, watch Dotson. You see Dotson come downhill and, and attack that tight end, and it opens up this passing window to Smith, right? Um, and they're able to get. Uh, 12 yards on or 14 yards on this play. And, and I'll show you why we're breaking this down here in a minute. Yeah. And this is this kind of play also represents some of what started to happen in the second half when the Eagles run game started to work like the RPO game started to open mm-hmm. up a little bit more. We saw more open up with the play action and deep crossers in the second half. Like this is just, you know, the individual play in and of itself here working early on or not working early on if you're the bills. Um, but their vulnerability against the run in the second half started to open up these more and make, uh, you know, the Eagles, I think it was that one stretch where, Hurts through like two touchdowns in his in three attempts because he wasn't throwing the ball a whole bunch. Like they were just running yeah. it down the Bills' throat, and it made them vulnerable in other areas here, like they did. Uh, like on this glance to Devonta Smith. Yeah, and so they the Eagles come back to it. You talked about it. They'll spam plays if yep. they know they're going to work. So this is in the second quarter, eleven seventeen on the clock, second and ten situation. But look at Leonard Floyd and Dotson again. Watch how they play. Look at Dotson. Does a great job staying in that seam, deterring that route to Devontae Smith there, but keeping his eyes on that slide route from the tight end. Leonard Floyd does a good job of getting in that passing lane, attack, uh, attacking the pass here. He gets a piece of it, and what happens? The mm-hmm. ball's intercepted by Bernard. So very good work by Dotson. He bounced back there. He, he took away that seam route, forced Hurts to go to the slide route. Leonard Floyd does his job, uses those long arms to get his hands in the passing lane, and the balls are the, the ball's up in the air, and it's intercepted. Yeah, just making the read a little more muddy for Hertz and not declaring or committing right out of the gate and making it easy for him to be like, oh, okay, player A did this, I can go to the tight end or I can hit the glance. Like, just reading it out a bit more instead of being out, I don't want to say fooled, but instead of being, you know, so outright committed to honoring that run action, you get a bit more of a of a slow play there from Dodson. Like you said, he's able to kind of muddy this up by playing that way and covering down on the tight end, but also muddying up that seam and you get a really good play from Floyd and uh, man, things are so promising at this point. I was so excited. (laughs) I know, man, they're getting turnovers. They're getting after it. I mean, it was definitely looking promising uh, at at that stage in the game. So let's fast forward a little bit to the third quarter here. Again, these, Mm. this is when the adjustments started happening and this was a big play. This was a 33 yard gain on second and six, but I want you to watch. You know, Devontae Smith on that deep over route, he runs it across the field. It gets a nice clear out from A.J. Brown. Nice, you know, two-man game down the field. And then, again, that speed, he hits the burners, and he's up the field. So it's a three-by-one set, and the Bills have a, a quarters variation called on this play. And a lot of times when they do this, since you only have the single receiver to the uh, top of the screen, that you know, isolated, usually the alpha wide receiver, a lot of times what the Bills do, they'll lock him. They'll like a Meg man, man, anywhere he goes, right? Everywhere he goes. And so that's kind of what it looks like here. Rasul Douglas. I mean, I don't know if he, he just slips or the power of physicality of AJ Brown, um, you know, creates a separation, but you can see he gets left behind. Mm -hmm. And so now typically what's going to happen is if you're having this crosser from Devante Smith come across, uh, Jordan Poyer is going to call a cut. And usually you have the cut from the safety and, Mm -hmm. but he can't. Because of AJ Brown over the top. <laughs> and so I, I almost feel like Rasul Douglas obviously doesn't see him even at this point. And then he's like, oh, there he is. And then it's just <laughs> too late. Jalen Hurts is able to push the ball down the field and you get that big gain down the field. But the play action was something they went to a little more. And you saw what it did. It, it gets the offensive line right onto the defensive uh, defensive line, doesn't uh-huh. allow them to, again, just tee off on the quarterback and then look at the pocket and the, you know, the vision. It helps his vision. And then Devontae Smith, again, wide open on this deep crossing route. This won't be the last time you guys see this play. No, this happened. When this happened in the game, I was worried. And then watching it on tape, like I immediately kind of remembered the bookmark in my head for it. And 
even though I knew the result of this play already, I was watching it here and watching Douglas fall off or while well, I like, get left behind. I kept hoping like, oh, ooh, maybe he's going to fall off and pick up Devonta Smith. And I was like, no, this play has already happened, Anthony. Like that's right. going to be the thing. And it's just, man. Yeah. Like I, well, it's funny how you like explained it with Rasul Douglas. Cause I was, it's almost like, yeah. Like I didn't know if he got beat or like he purposefully got into like a really deep trail. Like I was just confused as to <laughs> what this he a was new doing. technique. <laughs> yeah. I really was like, do I not know? Is this, yeah. What is this? Um, cause it, the way he fell off him, it almost, it looks like he's passing him off and right. he's going to fall off. Like, oh, okay. He's past 15 yards or whatever. I know I'm dropping him. Let me get like, I expected his eyes to get on Devonta Smith right here. Like it right. just seemed like he purposefully so let, yeah, like it, it's even for, and for, you know, everyone watching and or listening, like why we're kind of breaking that down even further is because even when, like Eric said, like that's a standard, like three by one call, like you lock that one receiver side, the mm -hmm. meg call, it is what it is, but you don't give him that much space. Like you are not falling off to that degree. And no. so, and it just looked like it almost looked purposeful. Like he purposefully let him go. Cause even right. Like when Brown starts to separate, it's not like Douglas gets on his horse to try and get back there. He kind of almost just lets it happen. And it was, it was very weird and it led to like a really big gain. And again, here comes another crosser. Fantastic. Yeah. So you get that 33 yard gain and you hope that the coaching staff adjusts to that mm -hmm. and call something different. Mm -hmm. Well, now we're in overtime 427 on the clock, second and 10 situation. You get a 17 yard gain on guess what? The very same play. No yep. pressure, of course. That doesn't help the um, you know, the defense and the coverage. Um, here comes Devontae Smith from the top of the screen. There's the lock. Rasul Douglas again. Either one of the one of these two guys has to cut this crosser. You see Poyer yes. pointing him out. Yes. And I assume that Hyde is again supposed to cut that. And Douglas is just gonna stay locked in that trail on AJ Brown. Well, Hyde's a little late on it, and you see the completion, and you get a big 17 yard gain. And once they hit this in overtime, like it's over, yes. it, it's over. That was literally it. And, and again, look at the pocket. And, and it's these are the type of plays that happen late in games. You know, one little explosive play, like the Patriots game, the first play. You mm -hmm. know, they get that little swing screen out to uh, Ramondre, and he mm -hmm. takes it. You know, was it 60 yards or something like? Yeah. This was the play. I was like, they're in trouble because this is a play that we saw earlier in the game, and you would expect something different. When you saw this formation, this trips formation with the tight end in that offline position, and you would expect that the defense would have adjusted to this. They didn't, and the Eagles just took advantage of it. And we've seen this, Eric, so – because the, the Bills play quarters, and they're good at it. Like, how many times have we seen Hyde and Poyer cut or poach on that, like, over yep. from the trip side, like, or even a two-by-two, two, like, and they take that away. They do it so much, and I don't know if Hyde recognized it late – or just or like, well, somebody got their wires crossed or whatever the hell. Like, it's just, I was surprised again, like seeing their execution of this coverage against this look. And, you know, now one of those guys has to break. One of those so, guys has to cu cut it off. And right? so now my thought is like, because Hyde is sitting there relaxing on it. Like my thought was, is Douglas supposed to fall right. off and pick Possible. up Devonta Smith? Like, even though they haven't done that a ton, We've seen Tredavious White do it at times, you know, falling off in like his deep third or deep quarter coverage, like it, it, throughout the years. And we know Rasul Douglas can do this. He is good no in quarters and cover three, covering in his deep third or his quarter and playing things, reading it out and falling off his man. So I just and maybe I don't know they if, maybe they did switch it for Rasul yes. because he is that playmaker yes. and he can recognize this thing. But maybe he just got zoned in and, and tunnel vision looking at AJ Brown going vertical. So. I mean, there is a possibility that they tweak the scheme to to fit Douglas here, and he is supposed to fall off. But more times than not, it is a cut from Hyde. Yes. But based on the way Hyde's opening here, maybe maybe it is on Rasul. And I mean, you try to gauge afterwards who's looking at who, and you know, yeah. showing some of their body behavior. Um, it, it's tough to say here. I don't know. It, it's tough. It's just unfortunate because again, you would expect your uh, defense to uh, adjust to that, right? And and they just didn't. And even like you would expect them to adjust like first, but second, they, that's not how they play against that route distribution coming out of quarters normally. Like they don't let that route develop. Usually it's, it is that cut or that poach from Hyde or Poyer, whoever's playing on what side. And that's what made me think like, was Douglas supposed to fall off? But even so, like 
then it goes to, okay, why is everybody not on the same page? Why are we not executing in this high leverage situation? Like it, no matter how you slice it, I guess like one answer is maybe potentially like less shitty than another, but they're all still like not good. And those plays really started to encapsulate like what we saw for the defense in the second half, like poor individual execution or just getting outright beat by the players on the Eagles or lack of schematic adjustments, lack of schematic integrity, and really just being gamed up by the Eagles spamming mm-hmm. consistent plays and matchups, knowing like, Hey, they keep not adjusting to this thing we're doing. If if we do a, they're going to do B. Oh, they're still doing B. All right, let's do a again. And they did right. that with passing concepts, run concepts throughout the entirety of the second half. Yeah. And so we just got to like the two minute warning uh, in the fourth quarter there. Um, and I want to cut out away from that film. Cause I do want to talk about the, you know, the struggles when it comes to end of game situations with McDermott this year. Um, because it just seems like they can't close a game out on the defensive side. And of course, of course, injuries play a factor. Yes. You can't ignore those injuries, especially when you talk about the specific people, Milano, Daquan Jones, Trey White, the guys that were injured in the roles that they played in the level of play they were playing at mm-hmm. when they did get injured. Um, so there's no doubt that's a factor, but it's such, it's so uh, discouraging to see a defense in regulation you know, they're ninth in defensive EPA. They're ninth. They're a top 10 team on defense when it comes to regulation uh, defense. But even then when with they all get, the injuries, like that's even with all the like, injuries. Like, so they yeah. still weather, they weathered the storm enough. Yes. Yes. They do enough. There's enough variance there. There's some plays in there, especially when they're getting those turnovers. They're able to do some really good things. But when you look at two minutes uh, left in the game into overtime, they go to a 29th ranked defense in EPA. So, it's tough, man. It, it's it's been tough to um, again analyze this, and I'm sure I'm sure this is the number one thing that they're studying in this uh, in this uh, you know week off in, in their bye week. They're self scouting this because McDermott has just struggled to close out games. If we you know look at what the the Patriots game, the Giants game, they got lucky. Mm-hmm. Let's be honest, mm-hmm. they didn't even really close it out from a defensive standpoint <laughs> in that game. Mm-hmm. Um, the Broncos game, oh my god, I was there for that. It was horrible. Mm-hmm. Um, and then this game, so. Man, what are your thoughts on, you know, the struggles of this defense this year? Obviously, injuries aside, what are some things that come to mind about their inability to really just close a game out on the defensive side? The first thing that comes to my mind is, and you mentioned it a little bit, so the the three big, you know, we'll exclude the Giants one because the Bills won, but right. – well, I will at least, <laughs> but like the three blown leads there at the end on those final drives, Patriots, Broncos, Eagles, three completely different tiers – of offenses, different styles of offenses, and the way the Bills lost against each of them just really signifies like ineptitude in those moments. Like it's not like, oh, you know, well, all three teams are tremendous at this one thing. It looks like the Bills are vulnerable to this one thing. No, it's they lost in three different stylistic ways mm-hmm. against the pass, against the run. It wasn't just one concept or one area of the offense or one specific gamed up scheme that they failed against. It was just an overall failure. And that signals to me, again, Eric, like with the theme we have here, an overall ineptitude in those moments where it's not necessarily because of this, you know, the type of offense they're facing or the talent level that they're facing. It's more just the Bills themselves struggling in those moments. Because again, regardless of team, and it's almost kind of funny how it works out. Like the Patriots are a bottom level team, the Broncos are a middle level at this point, and the Eagles right. are top tier. So it's you kind of got like a, a bit of representation from everyone all over the board in terms of who they struggled against and how they failed. Yeah. And so if we, you know, we had Adam look into this, it's something I was like, you know what, we need to start diving into this since it's shout, shout out to Adam. He's been going yeah. crazy with the charts. He's been congrats. crushing this. Thanks yeah. to true media. So he looked at the teams from 2020 on, and if they had a lead of eight points or less with under two minutes to go, and you can see the bills. Um, if you look at defensive success rate, uh, they're on the lower end, um, and yards per play surrendered actually, um, on the lower end. So you're like, okay, they're completing, um, some short passes. They're limiting those explosive, especially late in the game. That's kind of like what we expect from the Bills, right? Kind of limit mm-hmm. those explosive, bend but don't break. Um, but you can see the success rate there. Um, again, that's including this year. But if you go to the next post um, and, and take away McDermott's year as a DC, the Bills are actually not too bad. You see them, they're above uh, the trend line right here in yards per play surrendered and defensive success rate. They're actually a little bit better. So, you guys in the chat room is saying, well, they couldn't really close out things with 
Frazier, yeah, I understand that, but they actually had a better, a higher uh, success rate on defense when it was just Frazier without McDermott's year. Obviously not complete yet, but still. Uh, and then Adam dove in even deeper about adding the playoff games, and he says yards per attempt increases, but success rate is still strong, one of the best in the NFL. So what's going on here? And And that's the question. What's going on here? And so we attacked it from several different ways when it comes to the data, when it comes to the film. We're going to show you a little bit of both actually tonight, of course. Um, and so I want to start off with, okay, I started looking at like, what's the pressure like? Like what mm -hmm. are they getting pressure? Are they blitzing more? McDermott obviously is more aggressive than mm -hmm. Frazier was. Mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, not, most people are, right? When it comes to defensive <laughs> coordinators. Like that's yeah. what we wanted. Let's be honest. That's what all, yes. we all wanted. That's, Absolutely. that's what we all wanted. That's what we asked for. So I started with that. So let's look at overall pressure rates. Uh, from the Bills this year, and overall, this is not this is regulation. This is not two minutes or less in overtime. So you can see the blitz rates are actually super low for the Bills. Mm -hmm. So they're blitzing less, but they're still creating pressure and sacks. Um, so you can see they're just under forty percent uh, pressure rate. Um, so they're one of the higher teams when it comes to that. Um, and their sack rate in regulation is nine point four percent, nine point five percent, which is I think fourth overall. So their mm -hmm. sack percentage is really good. Mm -hmm. When you're talking regulation, so you're like, well, then why do they struggle in the you know late in the game and and you know in overtime? Well, here it is. So this is the the pressure rates when there's two minutes or less and a team has zero to eight, uh, it's eight or fewer points uh, lead, right? So mm -hmm. the Bills are actually blitzing more. They're blitzing more, and they're getting a slightly bump in pressure rate. So. That when you blitz more, obviously, Anthony, that means you're sending an extra guy, which means what in that in the late in the game that there's more open space mm -hmm. underneath. Mm -hmm. You have one less or minimum one less player out there in coverage to play against the route distribution. And the big, big thing too there, Eric, you have that sack percentage, like in the notes of like, it goes from 9.5%, which is fourth to 2.4%, which is yes, 21st with two minutes left in the game. Yeah, that was a tremendous stat. Reiterate that. Reiterate that. Cause that's so, huge. Sack percentage, so again, of the like entirety, 9.5%, which is fourth in the league. It drops down to 2.4% with two minutes left and under, which is 21st. So they go from a 9.5% sack percentage to a 2.4% sack percentage with two minutes and below. And then, so then you pair that with the chart that you showed, Eric, of they're starting to blitz more. So you're not really having an uptick in pressure. You're not getting home. You're also sending more people at the quarterback. Yeah. There's just, it's just basic math again. Like there's more space. There's one less player out in coverage. And we saw that again, this Eagles game, like I said, it's a fun microcosm and representation of what we've seen this year, but that's what really happened in the fourth and OT. Like you were just seeing, Oh, here comes a Taron Johnson mm -hmm. blitz up. Oh, it's not getting home. Hurts dumps it down. There's space six yards. Oh, broken tackle. Now it's nine yards, 10 yards. You were just seeing the ineffectiveness in heating up the quarterback. And I'm not even talking about just getting sacks, like just generally heating up the quarterback, forcing him off the spot, having him to make a throw. The juice was not worth the squeeze when they were bringing pressure. And then they were getting gouged because they had less numbers in coverage. And right. again, that, that what was happening then against the Eagles, it's not just, in a vacuum against the Eagles, it's representative of what they've been on this year yeah. as a whole. And, and you'll see it. We'll show you. Yeah, yeah no doubt. I mean, even it's to look there, like, let's talk about the Broncos one, like the cover zero blitz, like they, to yeah. Jerry Judy, like, mm -hmm. and also to even, I don't even want to break that down that because I'm just going to get mad again. But like, that's a good example too. Like they blitz yeah. and it like worked against them. And if you start to play, if you're thinking back to these drives, the Pats or the Broncos, the Eagles start to think of the failures late in games or the second half as a whole and think about how much more blitzing you're seeing and the lack of effectiveness with it, and it'll start to kind of connect some dots and light bulbs will go off. Yeah, and as you'll see later, more times than not, the Bills are sending five-man pressures. So they're going to send a Taron Johnson, they're going to send a, a Micah Hyde or a Jordan Poyer. And usually, you know, uh, if they want to send two, if they send Poyer and Hyde or Poyer and Johnson, one guy's dropping out. And that's usually a defensive end. And so, again, you're getting a defensive end in space. And usually, and the Bills... Edges have been pretty good when you're talking Rousseau and Floyd about getting pressure Epinesa, but now you're getting those guys out in space, which I get, but again, presenting different looks is great and sending and, and dropping guys. We're all about it. Mm -hmm, but absolutely. in these moments, you're already struggling at the second level so much so that you're having Jordan Poyer play backer yeah. at times. Right. And 
you know, we've seen Neil there as well, you know, in there for Dotson earlier in the year, as we showed you, uh, we'll show you later. So again, now you're dropping a D end out and sending that guy. It just, there's a lot going on. And I think that MO of aggressiveness of McDermott's really showing up even more so in those cr critical moments. Yes. So no, go ahead. I don't want no. So, and then to tie into your Poyer point, because rap is out, no disrespect to Cam Lewis, but Cam Lewis is like the third safety that's mm -hmm. on the field. So now you're dropping known rushing quantities who have been working with Floyd, Rousseau, and Epinesa, and you're sending coverage guys, but then you're also weaker in coverage because if you're sending Poyer, you have Cam Lewis back there in coverage. So you've got less numbers in coverage and or less coverage specific players working with an overall like lack of depth mm -hmm. and lack of effectiveness. It's just... It's almost, it's not too cute, but it's almost like you have to rein yourself in and be like, we don't have the horses for me to do this. Let me kind of just get mm -hmm. almost, I, I don't want to say this and have anybody get upset. You almost need to simplify it a bit more and just get back to your four man rushes and rely on those horses because you don't have the horses on the back end and coverage to be able to get cute like that. Right. And so now let's, uh, we looked at, you know, the blitz rate, the pressure rate and how that changes from regulation to the two minutes. Uh, a two minute drill there. Um, so let's look at defensive rates overall. Um, look at the defensive success rate on the left. And then you got the first downs per attempt and um, the bills, they allow in regulation, they allow a lot of first downs per attempt. They're 25th it's crazy. overall. And even defensive success rate, they're kind of average, average defensive success mm -hmm. rate at 14th overall. You can kind of see it there. So in regulation, Hey, they do allow, you know, guys to get first downs. There's no doubt about it. And it doesn't change when you're looking at it um, in the two minute um, area of, of the game. So now if we do look at that again, uh, two minutes or less, including overtime, zero to eight point differential in the score, the bills again, once again, high first down per attempt rate, they're 27th overall. And just an awful success rate. It goes from 14th to 28th uh, mm -hmm. defensive success uh, percentage. So, um, it's, it's really bad. It's under 40%. So they're not able to, you know, stop these, uh, opposing offenses once, you know, th there's two minutes left in the game and they're allowing a lot of first downs. I think they're averaging like 3.7 first downs in, in that range of two minutes or less with that score differential, which is a lot for, for, for those of you playing at home. First. That, that's a lot. It's 31st. And think about that a few first downs and they're already, you know, in, in range. striking range. Yes. Yeah. Um, and, and. Adam brought up one last chart here and he, he says how defenses defend a one score lead with two minutes or less remaining in regulation for this season. And Oof. as you can see the series conversion rate. So that's the amount of drives that um, are extended because of a first down or score mm -hmm. in the bills. You can see where they're ranked They're They allow the highest. So Not that good. is why <laughs> that is why, you know, the, the bills defense has struggled you know, late in these games and listen, I get it. And we're going to show you film more times than not McDermott, especially the start, he plays pretty soft coverages, right? He bend, but don't break. Uh -huh. But then as those offenses dink and dunk their way down the field late in the game, as they, you know, you're playing Jalen hurts. He's pretty clutch. You know, they start dinking and dunking down the field. Then that pressure starts building up and he's like, I got to do something. He said it in his presser and it's going to stick with me for the rest of the year. Uh -huh. When he was asked about that zero blitz against that empty look, and when they scored, the Eagles scored to win the game. He said, I felt like I had to do something. That right there. That That's right there. Is that is exactly why you're seeing these numbers. Uh, again, he lets it he lets it go, lets it go. And don't get me wrong. He does change up some of the coverages and all mm -hmm. that. He mm -hmm. went to some man. He went some mm -hmm. quarters. They were playing two man. Bus, I was like, oh, my two God. Man. Two man. Yep. And then what were they doing? They were just swinging it to the running back. And Bernard's yeah. out leverage. We're going to get to some of that. But. That right there is is what is in a nutshell has happened to this Bills defense late in games. And it's just it's been a gut punch. Like literally three. I can understand the Eagles one because the caliber team that they are, but when you are allowing these these chokes to happen against the caliber of the Broncos, and I know mm -hmm. where they are and kind of middle tiering now, but that that sh loss still should not have happened. The Patriots one is the most egregious. And yes, you yeah, because he against... blitzed like 65% of the time oh. against Mac Jones there. Or yeah. again, we're going to cover some of that, but it's like, come on, man. Like, was that needed? No. And Eric, these are some numbers too, like real quick that I, I gave yeah. you offline before we went live. Like, so 
the graphs and charts and what we we're just showing right now, like speaks to like the very like late game scenarios and situations, but the second half versus first half differences, there's some pretty stark differences in stats. So the bills defense on the year against the run in the first half, they are second in rushing EPA and first in rushing success rate in the second half. They're 30th in rushing EPA 29th in rushing success rate. They just get gouged on the ground in the second half. And it's again, it's not opponent specific. It's just on the year. There's also a drop when it comes to a uh, success rate against the pass 15th in the first half against passing success rate 20th in success rate against the pass in the second half. So only, you know, a five spot drop, but, they're a little worse against the pass in the second half, significantly worse against the ground mm-hmm. in the second half. And when you're adding all of that together with what we've done so far, Eric, it just continues to paint this picture of a lack of adjustment, teams figuring things out and really starting to gouge you in certain areas. And I I wanted to bring up the run piece because it was so significant in this game against the Eagles. Like the Eagles just really leaned into the ground in the, in the second half and the Bills just did nothing to combat it. Yeah, and that's surprising when you talk about those numbers because it, it right. felt like early in the season everyone was complaining that they get out, they would get you know slow out of the gates, mm-hmm. um, and so to to hear some of those numbers, especially the run game, um, and yeah, if you're just looking at the numbers, to me it's like, why is that happening? Because the offense that you're playing is adjusting, but are you as a defense adjusting? It doesn't yeah. seem like that's happening, uh, especially when you're talking about uh, the actual run game. Oh. Uh, thank you very much for the super chat, Bills Witch. Thank you very much for, for being here in general, but also for the super chat. And the comment is someone needs to tap their index finger on their temple and stare straight at McDermott. Uh, yeah. yeah, you know, this these struggles, Eric, are going to continue to kind of fall at his feet and fall onto his shoulders, however you want to place it or where you want to place it. And yeah, just with the theme of what we were doing in this episode and, you know, you you and I were are looking at the charts earlier today. Mm-hmm. And so that's what kind of, spurred me to be like, Oh, I want to take a look at some first half or second half specific things. And I was even surprised like to see that significant of a drop off against the run and even the pass a little bit, but more against the run, all of it just again, points to a lack of adjustment, a lack of effectiveness. And again, not to give him a pass. The injuries are a significant piece. Oh yeah. We're going to like that, (laughs) But, (laughs) but, but, but also that Eric ties into what we said earlier a little bit where, it's not fair really, but you still have to be able to correct for that in some degree. Like maybe you reduce how complex you are. Maybe you reduce some of the looks or coverages you're sending because you don't have the personnel to be able to execute it at the level you need to. And here's a blitz right now from Taron Johnson. Oh, this one got me because he was so close, but the running back just gets a piece of him. Yeah. And so again, we're under two minutes here in the fourth quarter, first and 10 situation. This is a nine yard game. This is the first, this is the very first play of that Eagles drive that goes down to tie the game with the field goal. This is the first play right out of the gate. Right. And so the bills send a a five man pressure. So they're dropping Jordan Poyer out. They're dropping Leonard Floyd out playing palms coverage three over two to each side, two by two formation. Um, And they're sending Taron and they're sending Bernard and yeah, Taron Johnson's coming from, you know, left field basically. So it takes a few (laughs) minutes to get there. Um, And right here hurts almost pulls it down. And yeah. ends up wanting to take off, but he stays in there. And then AJ Brown to the bottom of the screen does a good job of creating some separation, some space with a little push off. And then Hurts just resets and fires it down there. So again, you're sending a five man pressure. And this has been Anthony. We've talked about this since the Jags game. You know, you're sending these blitzes and they're not affecting the quarterback. Yes. So at some point, you got to say, Hey, I understand you want to pressure the quarterback, affect him to get the ball out. But look how much time he still has to make this throw down the field for a nine yard gain. And we've shown some really successful blitzes, even against, and I know people say, well, it was against the Jets, but even against the Jets last week, so as recent as the previous week, Sean McDermott has had successful five and six man pressures. Granted, a bunch of them have come with uh, Matt Milano and Daquan Jones on the field. Right. But it's funny you mentioned the Jags game because this is the first thing that came into my head seeing this play. And this rush uh and like the the lack of getting home and the spacing for it and the time it takes like you'll see it creep up a bunch in this game that was that was exactly where my head went to first i was like it's like the jags game all over again you're sending pressure almost almost like you're sending it just to send it because terry right. johnson has to come from so far away and you know, good kudos to Kenny Gainwell for getting enough of a piece of Taron Johnson to be able to give Hertz that time. But 
just from a probability standpoint, that's not really going to get home to you. Like Hertz is in the middle of the field. Taron Johnson's coming from like almost by the numbers in the slot. Like that's a big ask to expect him to get home and heat up the QB. Right. And so now we fast forward to the next play. 121 left in the game for some intense situation. You get an 11 yard gain. So again, completing those passes, but not in that low end of yards per attempt um, in, in yards per completion, uh, like we've seen in some of those, like we saw in some of those charts, but watch they, you know, they drop out into that too high shell and there's no pressure. And I talked about it earlier. There's no pressure up the middle. And one thing I want you guys to start paying attention to, and it's something again, we wanted it. We wanted to see Greg Rousseau at defensive tackle. Mm -hmm. We wanted to see him, but when you look at some of the power that the bigger guys at defensive tackle can generate to push mm. the pocket, like you saw with Jordan Phillips, you're just not getting that with Rousseau. And so now that pocket, look how much, look at the pocket. Like there's the interior of the pocket. We always talk about interior offensive line are responsible for the depth of the pocket. And then the tackles are responsible for further width. Well, like there's no pressure here up the middle. And Jalen is able to see the entire field. And he just runs, uh, man, this, this route, this route concept is never going to leave us either. He's got that two high levels. Yeah, yeah, levels. Yeah. The one that the bill spam right here and right here. Um, uh, <laughs> and, and AJ Brown, he uncovers, there's no pressure. It's an easy pitch and catch for 11 yards. And then the Eagles are once again, moving the chains. It's so funny that you said that because like even when I was watching the tape and I saw this, I was annoyed at the lack of pressure. And then I was like, oh, levels like, of course, like just kill me twice on this yeah. play. Thank you so much. But yeah, you, you nailed it. Like it's there when the Bills were getting that muddle rush early in the game. They weren't just like kind of sitting at the line or sitting too far back. Like they were controlling the width. They were driving guys into the backfield. They were creating some sort of displacement. And you don't have that here. Like you've got a nice, comfortable pocket for Hertz. Vaughn gets run right around the arc. You're not getting any compression from Leonard Floyd on the outside. He's getting pushed up field uh, by Jordan Mailata. And then, yeah, there's nothing on the inside from Rousseau and and Oliver knocks Dickerson back a little bit, but then Dickerson anchors and settles that's in. it. Yep. Settles and and got nothing. And then AJ Brown just has a ton of space because again, the bills are playing softer and playing off and it's, it's just a bad giving up space in coverage and also not getting pressure is literally like the worst combination you can have on defense. And yeah, right. Bills had it a lot <laughs> in this game. Uh, so uh, we're going to fast forward a little bit. So still in the fourth quarter, 58 seconds left in the fourth quarter. Second and four here. Here's an 11-yard gain, easily moving it down the field. And what do you know is happening? Uh, against the Eagles, it was these field blitzes. So when they send two guys off the edge, it was from the field. And if you guys don't know that, uh, when defensive coordinators are um, used, are setting up their game plan and blitzes, sometimes they're field blitzes. Sometimes they're boundary blitzes. Sometimes they want to attack the running back side of protection. You know, mm -hmm. uh, Like you see here, for the Eagles game, most of the blitzes came from the field. So you see that to the top of the screen. So with those two guys coming, that means Epinesa and Poe are dropping out underneath. Again, Palms coverage, two by two, or three over two to the top, three over two to the bottom. And again, Hertz is seeing it. There's no pressure. Look at the pocket. It's an easy pitch and catch for Devontae Smith. And then boom, there's another 11 yards. And this one, I, I don't. I don't hate the idea of this. And we've seen AJ Epinesa have a pick six, like dropping into coverage. Like he's been athletic at times. I don't like this because of the situation. It is second and four. And Devonta Smith literally just hitches it up at five yards, like one yard past the sticks. This, I like simul. I love, I shouldn't say like, I love simulated pressures. I love creepers. I think being able to disguise your front and lean into that type of pressure package is hugely important for defenses in today's NFL. But the situational use of it here, I don't like the call. Like it's easy for, again, Devonta Smith to just hitch up, hurts is in rhythm and good timing and just fires it to him. There's nothing that he doesn't have to wait for anything to develop downfield because it's third and nine or something like that. And there, it doesn't really give the pressure a chance to get home because it's such a short down and distance hurts literally catches this ball, like hits a couple yeah. steps and fires it out. Like it, it's, it's a bad timing for this call compared and also like combined with the lack of just overall individual effectiveness up front. Like it's, it's just bad timing, bad execution, bad call, all of it. Yeah. And, and again, they saw this several times in this game. There's Kelsey identifying the mic. Uh, the Bernard right there. So they know they're they're going to slide to that side. But the guy's coming off the edge, and it's picked up rather well. It's picked up rather well from the field. There it is. You got, again, you got one, two, three, four. Well, guess what? All covered. All bases <laughs> yeah. covered. All right. Um, here's your contained player. 
Again, you're not getting that push up the middle. He's got a really nice sight line. Look at the field. Like he can Beautiful. see the entire field from here. And it's again, it's a short pitch and catch, but that it's just so obvious. And so now we're going to kind of get into um, similar, again, similar situations and the game scenarios under two minutes with uh, the Bills up in these games and the opposing offense is driving down there. We're going to show you these plays. So on this play, and more times than not in this game, it was a boundary blitz. So hide and pull are blitzing, as I have outlined there. And now you're dropping Floyd again, one of the, their best pass rusher, probably off the edge. Absolutely. And, and and it's picked up by that four man slide again. And then you're you're getting a pass over the middle for an, a 14 yard gain. And look at it from the end zone angle. I mean, Mac Jones versus cover three. Here's Floyd underneath. Here comes a crosser. So he hits him. Well, it's a high low. You have the tight end behind him. AJ Epinesa isn't quite able to get there. The pass is completed for 14 yards. And so, again, it's a different coverage. It's not the Palms coverage, more that too high uh, shell coverage. It's a, a cover three, um, you know, blitz. So it's three deep, three under. And, and they're able to hit the high low over the middle. Yeah, just another example of, you know, pressing these buttons and having them not work out. And especially with what the Patriots do here, like they keep six in to protect um, with their offensive linemen. And then they have Ramondre Stevenson as well. Like you're almost better off just rushing for making them waste that man, like showing this look, but it's third and eight. Show them this look, drop out, make Mac Jones, especially for a quarterback like Mac Jones, who struggles with his decision making, who struggles with his reads, like again, a different tier, a different caliber of offense, like, but you're still treating it with your same blanket answer, regardless of opponent. And Matt Eric Jones like picked this. He like he bro, literally saw it coming. Look, bro, he's pointing, he's pointing yeah, it out. He's yeah. letting them know, hey, Poyer's the mic. That's who we're working to. So these four are coming. It's obvious. It's third and eight. And they're showing it almost probably too soon. And so yes. that he the offensive line and the running back, they know four on four. It's it's easy pickup. I mean, I know Epinesa gets the edge, but still, I mean, no, it's an easier pick up on it. They 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 gum it up, and so that was my like my bigger takeaway. And you started to talk to it like they're not they're not holding that initial look long enough and then bringing the blitz. Like it's just ineffective. Like it's allowing things to be easily diagnosed because of their alignment, and then also because they continue to use these type of looks. And there's another one with Greg Rousseau at defensive tackle, again, ineffective in that spot. He's also, again, like I, I, he's playing on a stub of a foot with what he's right, got right. going on and he's grinding through. But again, it's just stuff that's easily able to be identified by the center or by the quarterback, being able to be picked out, being able to be made ineffective with what you're doing. And then Eric, like we said, like if you're bringing the blitz and you're not getting home, you have less numbers and bodies and coverage. And not to mention with this specific type of rush, not only do you have six in coverage instead of having potentially seven, one of those six is Leonard Floyd. So you've mm -hmm. got less numbers in coverage, and one of those lesser numbers is an edge player. So you're almost losing like one and a half times there. It's just, again, like overall ineffectiveness patterns week after week in these similar type of moments. Right, and another situation, this time from the Giants game, fourth quarter, 58 seconds left in the fourth quarter. Third and two situation. This is only a three-yard gain, but again, this is that cover three boundary blitz against the Giants. And watch how quickly when Hyde and Neil blitz um, and putting Bernard and Miller underneath here, look at the leverage. I mean, this is easy leverage win for the running back. And here's a wide receiver. <laughs> there's a corner. I mean, there's just, there's too much space. There's too mm -hmm. much space in a third and two situation. And you're bringing the blitz. Why wouldn't you be up closer near the line of scrimmage in these type of situations? I understand you want to run zone blitzes. Like, that's fine. That's kind of at the heart of what, um, McDermott wants to do, but you're losing leverage. And you talked about not having the horses in Milano and the Daquan Joneses of the world. Like if that's the case, you need to close passing windows and mm. play a little tighter and then bail, you know, play up and then bail because you're just making this too easy. And, and Saquon Barkley's able to out leverage Bernard and the corner there. And he's converting. And that's why the bills are second worst team when it comes to series conversion rates on defense. The the pass rush and what's happening up front is not merging or marrying well with, with what's happening on the back end. Like you are like the whole the whole idea there is to like get quick pressure on Tyrod and right. like get home or force him into and a they bad got free throw. rushers. Yeah. They yes, free they runners. did like so imagine Eric, what would happen to Tyrod Taylor 
if I don't know, Christian Benford was up on the line on his man or like Bernard was up in a little bit mm-hmm. closer, like maybe this gets dumped down and it's a tackle right away. And it's a gain of one or a gain of no gain instead, like you were blitzing to either get home to the quarterback or heat him up. They do heat him up, but you didn't cover the frigging guy that mm-hmm. he would outlet it to like, so the, it nullifies what you're doing up front because you've given so much space and you've out leveraged yourself and allowed him to find an easy answer. This isn't like, well, Tyrod went from one to four really quickly and figured it out and processed. No. Right? Like, no, this is him. Had just, the answer. Yep. He had the answer right away. Like you are not, your plan on the back end is not matching the plan up front. And if you have that disconnect, it can hurt you. And when we've seen the bills defense falter, it's been when that plan in, on the back end and the front has not worked. Eric, you, you talked about it. In the individual episode you did after the Dolphins, and we talked mm-hmm. about it in the film room, to start that game against Miami, the pass rush plan and coverage was not working well together. Then they tweaked some things, and it was a beautiful marriage the rest of the way, and it was the reason they shut down that Miami offense. But it's easy for a pass rush plan and coverage plan to not be in sync and work well together, and that's what we're seeing here. Yeah, and this is the last play of the the defensive side of the breakdown. Um, and you talked about the injuries. like Not having Milano has been huge, obviously, so much so that uh, that, you know, they've obviously put Poyer in there at times. We saw Williams play a little bit. They had Saran Neal early, early in the year. So you see Neal in on this play. Um, you also have Rousseau, again, at the defensive tackle spot. I think they need to scale that back. Uh, mm-hmm. To your point, he's been doing it even when he's been injured. But mm-hmm. sometimes if you're only rushing four, you ha- you have to affect the, the middle of the pocket, and they have not been able to do that with Rousseau uh, consistently. So quarters coverage look, empty set. Um, and to the weak side of the formation, you're going to have your linebacker more times than not. This would be a Milano. This would be a Dodson or a Poyer. Uh, here it's Neil, and they're just running a high-low. So they're doing that little whip route to the boundary, and then they're getting that in-breaking route to Jalen Hyatt. On fourth and five, they're able to get 12 yards. This is one of those plays I talked about earlier, one of the highest EPA plays in that two minutes or less situation, um, and this is one of the higher EPA plays gained by the opposing offense. And It was on a critical down, you know, a money down fourth and five, and they're able to get 12 yards here over the middle on the high low. And so I ask if Milano's in there, one, are they running the same coverage? Mm -hmm. Two, is he going to bite on that whip route or is he going to be a little more disciplined because he's taking the reps in here and he's going to deter that route in behind him? Yeah. And so this is, you know, where things start to come full circle and, You know, that apex defender this time, it's Saran Neal instead of being Tyrell Dodson. But it was Dodson on that third down and three against the Eagles that Devonta Smith hitched up on. And this time it's uh, Saran Neal on a fourth and five. So different down, but very similar distance. But again, that same area of the field being manipulated or that same player being manipulated this time in a different way. Like you were attacking that apex defender. This time it's Saran Neal. He gets pulled out by that whip route. Look at the window. Like that is huge. There, Bernard is influenced on the inside by Waller and then Hyatt's able to just come around the back end and there's just a huge window for Taylor and again it's just oh like and I'm glad you mentioned Bernard because they're this is their trap side so it's the four Uh over three side so they have to trap this guy usually Waller if he's running an out route you're gonna have Taron Johnson trapping it well if that guy runs like a stick route or curl or crossing route that's Bernard's guy so that's Mm -hmm. why you see both of those guys kind of hugging Waller on top of hey it's the Darren Waller uh, yes. But that's why you see that, and that's why Matt Milano is so freaking important against these empty sets on the weak side of the formation. With him not in there, this window is a lot bigger. Again, he's been in this defense. Mm-hmm. He's played in this coverage. He's made interceptions in this coverage. The Titans game last year, he took it to the house. It's the very mm-hmm. same coverage. Like, it's not having him. Of course, it's a huge factor. And when you have Neil there just trying to do his best to stay with that whip route, when really he should be just settling in right in there and, and hopefully deterring the play. But again, this is one of those plays where, yeah, the not having Daquan Jones there, not having Matt Milano there lead to a 12 yard gain on fourth down. Yeah. And it's, it's it, at a certain point, you're waiting for it to kind of affect this team. Like further, when you lose top tier players that also play premium positions, it's really hard to overcome that. And when you're also, you know, kind of inept at, in-game adjustments and self-diagnosing in-game and figuring things out, it puts you into a spot where you can be gamed up. And I mean, here's so yeah, here's bad. one more. This is a lot. Yeah. <laughs> here's swear. again, you know, I and again, swear. another, this is also going to make everybody think that the bills suck at quarters and they should never run like a variation yeah. of it. They should never right. do anything with it. But again, like what's being gamed up, like you've got 
that into the boundary side, which effectively functions like man coverage yeah, with um, Christian Benford in Meg again against the single receiver and Devontae Parker, which means Dodson is responsible for Ramondre Stevenson. And that's a matchup you'll take 10 out of 10 times Ramondre, any running back out of the backfield against Terrell Dodson in space. Yeah. Again, when a lot of times what to do, um, this three by one set, three to the field here, uh, isolated receiver and a running back is they just lock it. We talked about it earlier. They just kind of lock it there. Uh, and so, again, Milano typically would be one-on-one -on -one with Stevenson, a, a pretty good receiving back. Well, mm -hmm. it's Dodson here, and it's a nice move from Stevenson. Um, mm -hmm. Thankfully, Dodson does trip him up, but this is another one of those EPA plays. It was one of the higher ones uh, in these situations late in the game, 28 seconds left in this one, um, and the Patriots are able to drive down there um, because, again, some of the plays that we, we've broken down, it's just it, it's been tough, man. You know, I, I went back and watched all this film um, on these situations and we, you know, we pulled some of those numbers. Um, it was, it was just dis discouraging to say the least, but I do believe that Sean McDermott and his staff are also doing the same thing. In fact, mm -hmm. they've probably already done it already. And they, I expect them to tweak some of these things again. Maybe you're not putting in certain formations, you're not putting Dodson, uh, locking him on the backside against a running back. That doesn't make sense. Why would you do that? Um, so I, I think some of those tweaks and adjustments will uh, take effect um, when it comes to after the bye week against the Chiefs and going forward. Um, but they also need to be able to do those type of tweaks at halftime, within the game, from the drive to drive. Like They need to do a better job of doing that. And maybe it has something to do with all the things that McDermott has to worry about as a head coach. Well, he needs to start you know, kind of delegating some of those things then because mm -hmm. they need to work together more. Maybe some other, other coaches and assistants need to step up a little more to help him with some of these things because he can't be everywhere at once. And that's a, you know, we talked about it a little, and I, and I don't think everything is, you know, can be explained away by him having a double duty, but that's a legitimately yeah. like hard thing. It's hard to be, you know, a head coach and also be like the play caller offensively or defensively, which again, like we've talked about, Eric, it's part of the reason, like, Andy Reid, you know, who does he have on defense? Steve Spagnolo. Oh, Zach Taylor for the Bengals. Who does he have on defense? Lou Anarumo. Like, you've got guys that, you know, if you're owning a side of the ball, you have someone on the other side that almost can kind of live in their own world as a head coach, you know, quasi head coach and run that side. So you are alleviated to a degree. Um, and obviously with what the Bills had on offense this year, that's been the antithesis of that. Right. So, like, if ever there was a year to have questions on the offense, this year would be the worst because Sean McDermott has taken over as defensive coordinator. Like this was the year where you needed, you know, the bows to be nice and neat and tidy on the offense so that Sean McDermott didn't have to wear all these different hats and kind of function in, in, in multiple ways. And we haven't seen that. That makes his job even harder. And then also too, like with this Eagles game, you know, again, coming off of it, the Eagles are a really good football team. They're really well coached. They have tremendous players. So mm -hmm. like it's already hard enough without getting yourself boxed into these areas. But I also think too, like the Eagles boxed you into some of those areas with their talent, with their scheme and their ability to win and kind of game them up a little bit. But it, it's when you connect those late game failures with the rest of the season, like we showed, then it starts to show that, okay, it wasn't just because the Eagles are a good football team schematically and talent wise. It's because some of this has to do with the patterns we're seeing on the defense for the bills. Right. And so, yeah, again, they do have to make some changes. Uh, I do think that they need to kind of scale back Rousseau's reps at D tackle. I want some more pressure up the middle uh, from the defensive tackles, guys with you know, a little more beef when it comes to that. Um, scale back some of those blitzes or at least vary them up, change them up because the ones that they are sending are just, they're seeing, P Mac Jones saw it from a mile away. Yeah. Like they're not, they're not they're affecting not the quarterback. They're not affecting the quarterback no. the way they should. Um, and then again, kind of bring that defense up a little bit. Like that's, that's what you got to do. Again, take away those early passing windows when the quarterback does want to get, get rid of it, um, late in games and move the, and matriculate the ball down the field. Like mm -hmm. you got to do some things to disrupt that timing and to affect the quarterback because what you've been doing so far in 12 weeks hasn't worked. So with that said, let's go to the offensive side. And while I queue everything up, uh, stay tuned for this quick read from Greg and uh, Aaron from Cover One Buffalo. Many people ask us the best way to support us here at Cover One, and that is to sign up to become a Cover One One Pass member. That contribution helps give us the access to all the data and information we use to create the content that you love. 
and I think most importantly brings you into our community of insiders. It's a great community there. based on Slack. I know a lot of people it's don't want to be on social media anymore, or be in on those conversations. We bring all of it to you right in our great community of educated fans. And most importantly, you get access to our content creators. Even better than that, everybody loves merch. You get awesome t-shirts, a cool decal, and a letter from the Cover One team signed directly to you. All for $60. That gets you the entire season, next year's free agency and draft. 60 bucks. Click the link in the description. Cover One Insider. Become one today. Ooh, Greg and Aaron making their weekly appearance in the Cover One film room by letting us know what's up when it comes to One Pass and all those pieces. And Eric, we talk about it every week, how much we love it, how much uh, it's it's become such an integral part to the brand. Um, and one of those pieces, too, like Aaron mentioned, um, that Slack channel piece, that aspect that so many of the insiders and the One Pass members love, like that ability to just have a really – passionate you know group of people coming together without the toxicity you get on normal social media channels and platforms and the multitude of things that we have in the slack channel whether it's bills related fantasy football related like there's a multitude of ways for the fans to kind of speak to one another engage with one another in addition to the access that you get to special things from the brand insider pieces special film stuff um a lot of connection with the brand and then just with the insiders themselves yeah i mean that's that's really what it, you know this is all about we couldn't do this without any of you guys. So um, with that said, uh, let's go forward into the film. Are you ready for the offensive side of the, the ball here, Anthony? I guess. I guess it would be nice to talk about fun stuff instead of just being all in the, on the bat. <laughs> I know. And, and hey, guys, we're a little harsh on the defensive side. I will say I don't care if they make a move on the defensive side or, you know, with the head coach, if they want to move on from him. I, I don't really care at this point. Um, I think he's earned some of my trust, but if mm -hmm. they believe like they should move on from them by all means, but I want to get to the offensive side, Joe Brady, mm -hmm. an awesome game plan against the Eagles, obviously a, a very good defense. Um, so let's get to some of that film. Let's start off uh, with a third and nine play here, Anthony. Um, this is a really nice route from Gabe Davis uh, to the bottom of the screen. Josh mm -hmm. scanning left to right, getting outside of the pocket, a little pivot away mm -hmm. from the defender mm -hmm. from Gabe. And it just, again, creates that separation. Just awesome stuff uh, from Josh Allen and Gabe on this play. I really like this route from Gabe Davis. You mentioned the pivot at the end, but I like the multiple deception points in his stem. Like, he has that initial kind of bounce outside right here at the 20, and then he kicks it in at the 15. Like, he's really getting up field, and then he settles down again. Like, that's a nice, nuanced route from Gabe Davis. Like, again, we, we talk about it so much with Stefan Diggs and we've talked about it with Khalil Shakir too, that ability to sell something other than what you're doing and lie with either your body language or your eyes. Gabe does it here with his head and his body language as a whole with those multiple deception points. Like Bradbury's a good corner. He had a mm -hmm. good game uh, here with, you know, that trap and that interception later. So that's a quality route against a quality corner. Yeah. And so we move on to the touchdown from Josh Allen. It's a nine yard uh, touchdown run. Very much like the game against the Jets, right? Uh, mm -hmm. You see an empty set. You see that stick concept. It's a pass run option. Okay, well, guess what? With everyone spread out, including these two linebackers, uh, you got a light box here, especially up the middle. And and this is a little full block for Mitch Morris. It's supposed to happen right here, but he doesn't even have to. Uh, he just stays inside and then picks up the linebacker, and Josh is able to get into the end zone for the touchdown. It's nice when... <laughs> your quarterback can just go into like an arm and shoulder tackle from a defensive tackle and just kind of carry him across uh, the goal line. Like he does the Fletcher Cox, like just this is, you know, kind of tapping into that unicorn ability of Josh Allen uh, with the design run here. It's a, it's a great time for the call. I like how they got to it. Not from the typical, like motion, the running back out of the backfield and kind of let everybody know what's going on. Um, not really telegraphing it. And you highlighted Mitch Morse's yeah. uh, path and his trajectory there. Like, yeah, he goes to full, but there's no one there. So what does he do? He gets up field and he ends up pulling a significant block against Zach Cunningham, which allows him to not really affect Josh Allen too much and allows Allen to just have to carry Fletcher Cox alone uh, across the goal line there. So good timing of the call, good setup of it, um, and a good play from Josh individually to just make something happen and drag a large yep. human across the goal line. 
And I just can't believe the Eagles didn't prepare for this. You know I was I mean? very like, surprised as well. Yeah. Like <laughs> I was really like, what you guys didn't think this was going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. And the, you know, especially these empty sets in the, the low red zone, like, come on. And like, they got so, they got so upfield here, like Reddick and uh sweat. And then Carter 98, like they literally invite it. Like they are pure, like pin our ears back. Let's get up field. And I'm like, it's first and nine and it's empty. Like, yeah, you really didn't like think that, okay, whatever, more power to you, I guess. Like, yeah, I, same boat. I was very surprised. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's uh, move forward. Second quarter, 537 on the clock. Third and seven situation here is a 31 yard gain. And this is our real estate rewind um, sponsored by Jonathan Miller of Metro Roberts Realty. And oh man, this is the choice concept. So top of the screen, you're having the, again, both of these receivers are reading leverage, reading leverage. Remember that later on uh, curl route from uh, Gabriel Davis. And then that like wheel route up the sideline, Josh stands tall with his back against end zone and delivers a big pass down the field for the explosive play. This is, I didn't realize how significant it was going to rain in this game until like the game was actually on and they kept showing like the, the comeback from commercial highlights and you'd see how much the rain was pouring. Like when you had those like high level views of the stands, like, so this is a, 34 yard hole shot from your own goal line in the rain, in the wind on third and seven. Like he fires this ball again. It's a 31 yard game, but he fires it like roughly 30, 40 yards downfield almost easily. And you got Deion Dawkins doing his Wee! little like belly flop piece. Yeah. Like which he seems to continuously I'm sorry. do like, after I'm, week. Oh my God. This is hilarious. I'm sorry. I had to interrupt you there because watch no, how Dawkins, good. he opens his chest. He doesn't show his hands and he, that the Eagles pass rushers love the long arm. They love the ghost stab. And, mm -hmm. you know, especially guys like Josh Sweat. And you see him, he goes for it, but he's not able to land it. And so then that, that's when you see that circle punch from Dawkins. And then he get, he leans on him and that drops Sweat. And then it's like, wee, yep. and he does a Superman on top of him. <laughs> and uh, I, I just love that because that's like Deion Dawkins. That's like his new signature. That's like his trademark. You saw it last week against the Jets. Late in the play, a little unnecessary, mm -hmm. but it's kind of mm -hmm. become his trademark. Yeah, that little belly flop piece. And uh, he also had a couple of nice snatch traps in this game. I think also against like Sweat, uh, the two that are in my head, I'm thinking of like he had some nice uh, plays and moments in this game. And yeah, like this is just, this is Josh Allen just being Josh Allen, like him uncorking this throw. Like it's a good job by Shakir continuing up the sideline. And you see uh, Bradbury up top, like he starts to sit, he starts to settle. He doesn't sink which makes this throw mm -hmm. available. He mm -hmm. doesn't do what Cam Taylor Britt did, which is just continue to sink and get underneath. Although that throw technically still was there in some way, like we talked about, yeah. but man, this is just, this is a dot. Like again, from the shadow of your own goal line in the wind, in the rain, and it's on the, it's on the money. Like this is a pinpoint laser throw 30 something yards downfield in the air, in the wind, in the rain, third and seven, your own goal line, just an absolutely beautiful throw. Um, from Josh Allen here for our real estate rewind presented by real estate agent, Jonathan Miller of Metro Roberts Realty. Jonathan uses cutting edge technology to help you sell your home faster. Professional photographs, a th 3d virtual tour, drone photos and videos are all included with each listing at no extra charge. He loves working with buyers and sellers in all price ranges. He donates a portion of his commission from each sale to help rescue an animal. His phone number and contact information can be found in the episode show notes, whether here on YouTube or whichever podcasting app or platform you are listening to this show on. Yeah, it was nice to see that Josh Allen back, right? Oh, His back, beautiful. you know, just calm, poised in the pocket, and then just unleashing that big throw down the field. So, oh, Eric, real quick, we got to stop. Yeah. We got super chat. We got super chat from Kevin G. Kevin, we appreciate you being here, and thank you very much for the monetary donation. Kevin says, "Ooh, th thoughts on using Vaughn at linebacker instead of Dodson in certain situations where he's only moving straight forward, thinking run, pass rush." I think it would be schematically not ideal. And I think you potentially kind of put yourself when you get that siloed from a rotation standpoint, Eric, it's part of the reason why we mm -hmm. didn't want to do the whole, like, um, you know, first and second down linebacker, third down linebacker yeah. type of thing. Like you can kind of get dictated to, and you kind of box yourself in when you get that siloed from that standpoint, I think, 
it could get fun in certain blitzes if you want to get really creative and kind of, you know, go with like an amoeba front. And then you're wondering like who's coming from where, who's doing what, but it has the opportunity to go really sideways potentially. But the thought is cool. What Eric would, uh, yeah, would yeah I, I wouldn't use Vaughn there again. I know he's struggling, um, but I will say like his reps in this game, they were better than the last. So he's. Yep progressively getting better yeah incrementally right yep. um he had it's some small, nice it's moves. small increments but it's yeah little by little. yeah and so and, and i do think top your expectations because i do I, I don't think he's gonna be 100 percent this year i just i just don't think he will um but he is showing some of that ability to turn the corner his burst isn't there and that was his trademark um yes. and so you got to give it time so i'm not using him anywhere but at edge especially don't want him at linebacker off the ball linebacker in space um chasing around people changing directions like that that's not his muscle memory that's not what he's used to doing can he drop into the hook to curl area when you know you're sending a linebacker and on and a creeper or some pressure yes but you got to limit that I, I just wouldn't use him in that capacity yeah he'd have to almost be like into the second part of kevin's comment there like where he's only moving straight forward thinking run and pass rush you're mm -hmm. almost like literally limited to okay you can put him there but you have to send him coming forward and if offenses know that that can kind of open a potential can of worms but i respect the idea of trying to get vaughn uh on the field some way yeah. to get effective or to make him effective while also limiting terrell dotson <laughs> <laughs> i know you should <laughs> oh man this episode just unfolded in a way i did not think it was I going know. to <laughs> i feel bad i feel bad i feel i feel because again he's played well recently yeah. i feel bad like it put him in a negative light but it is what it is all right so let's go to the second quarter one 58 left in the half third and five situation this is a 22 yard gain um just a great job by allen of extending the play but from the pocket you know climb in the pocket digs get into that secondary route um and you'll see it from the end zone angle it's it's just beautiful but mm -hmm. uh, on this third and five play they're actually trying to hit digs over the middle on this in breaking route you know they're clearing it with kincaid um, and Josh is obviously looking at the top of the screen, but he's coming back to digs for, you know, for a purpose, um, with the middle of the field open here. Um, but he sees that there's pressure coming and that guy is Reddick. Um, he's also got, I think it's Jalen Carter that won pretty quickly against McGovern. Um, mm -hmm. he climbs a pocket, um, and is able to hit digs and digs does a great job of realizing, okay, it's not there. And then you'll see him just pivot, boom, get into a secondary route, lose, uh, the corner there for the big play 22 yard game. Yeah, this one, uh, when I tweeted this play out, I just said like Josh Allen playing in X games mode. Like it's just, he, Jalen Carter beats Connor McGovern quickly and decisively. Like it's a beautiful club and then inside move from Jalen Carter. And he comes right down the pike at Josh Allen. Right at that time, Hassan Reddick beats Spencer Brown quickly and decisively. And it's, they both like meet at Josh Allen and he just gives the <laughs> slightest, subtlest step yeah. up and they collide right into each other. Like it's, it's not the same because it's not an open field aspect, but it reminded me a little bit of that Michael Vick run against Minnesota all those years oh, ago in yeah. OT where he cuts through and then Beaker, uh, the, the linebacker game. and the safety. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a walk off run, uh, scramble and like the two Vikings players collide. Like it's just such a slight simple subtle step up but what i really like about it is just how poised and calm he is like you've got two tremendous players bearing down on you and you don't have anything open yet and it's also third and five which is a high pressure high leverage scenario but he calmly steps up to avoid both of them keeps his balance from the contact <laughs> runs into right. osiris torrance then sees Diggs breaking open as he runs that secondary route, like you said. And look where he throws this ball from. Like, falling backwards almost after getting <laughs> bumped in the chest. No base, by yeah. yeah, bro. No base, all arm. And mm. look at the placement. The placement is perfect right into Diggs's chest. It allows him to still run and get some yards after catch there. And it comes right after he stepped up and avoided a sack and bounced into his own man, fell backwards, and chucked it. Like, th this play is... This play is ridiculous from Josh Allen. Like the effort, the execution, the play, like this is an unreal play. This is one of those plays where you highlight and can see, visually see Josh Allen's play speed on this play. Uh, now he's realizing, oh boy, there's pressure coming. But watch the mechanics as he climbs a pocket. Two hands on the ball, Beautiful. slides up. It's just like the, the Peyton Manning drill is what you call it, where you slide up in between the two bags on the ground. Slides up, keeps his eyes down the field. And like you said, he has no platform, no base. He runs into Torrance, and he's able to use his arm 
to make this throw down the field. <laughs> and you can see why uh, Slay was giving Josh Allen props at the end of this game and why the media, uh, you know, about the media giving him grief, Josh Allen grief, uh, about his play and throwing interceptions. He, dude, it, trying to guard one thing, Diggs, is one thing, right? Mm -hmm. Trying to guard Diggs with Josh Allen at quarterback is another thing. How he's able to extend the play in the pocket, outside the pocket, on the run. Uh, you see it all here from Josh Allen. Incredible play speed and placement on this ball to Diggs for the 22-yard gain. Just awesome stuff. And the, the, the pressure worked there. Like, if you're a slay, yeah. you're like, I took away the inside, and the pressure got there. Like, it, Josh Allen just made a play. He played above the scheme and made you wrong, even when you were right. Um, real quick, Eric, we do have another super chat yeah. from Brad. Appreciate you being here, Brad. And thank you for the, very much for the monetary donation. Brad says, I think this came up right at the end of the previous play. Mm -hmm. uh, but Brad says, but I thought our receivers never got open, dot, dot, dot. Weird how explosive the offense got under a new play caller. Imagine that. I will. I do agree, and I like what uh, Brady has done. I, ju I do think there's a lot of revisionist history with things that are happening now with the offense. There are pieces that th the Bills' offense are hitting, and a lot of it, too, I think is – and again, you can credit this to Brady, I think, a little bit. Um, but Josh Allen is starting to make those Josh Allen plays and throws again. I do think there were plays to be had under Dorsey that weren't. Mm -hmm. um, and now, like, they're happening under Brady, and everybody's acting like, oh, my God, we've never seen these plays happen in the history of ever. So there is some revisionist history for me. But, yes, I do think what we're seeing from an encouraging standpoint, certain guys getting open, certain explosive plays being developed, are a testament and credit credit to the wrinkles, tweaks, dials being turned and pushed um, from Joe Brady like we talked about. Right, and some of the plays that we've already diagrammed and broken down are plays and concepts that we've broken down every week with Dorsey as the OC. Mm -hmm. But there have been also some wrinkles that we've broken down, and you'll mm -hmm. see as we go forward, that are Brady-esque and, and more mm -hmm. to his you know liking um, in, in moving guys around and creating windows. Um, but I think the biggest change is Josh Allen's process. Like you can see mm. he's snappy through progressions. He I seems say more he's, comfortable. Yeah, he's more comfortable. So something that Brady did since he's taken over with helping Josh streamline the process, maybe again, just kind of whittle down that vision and say, Hey, you don't have to see everything. You don't have to feel mm. everything. You don't have to sense everything. Like start here. And just work progressively through the plays. I think that's probably where Brady has helped the most, more so than the actual concepts on the field. I think that mm -hmm. process is really where he's benefited. The quarterback has benefited. You, you know, Brady. you know what I've, I'm wondering. I just thought of this now, and it could be wrong. I wonder if because Ken Dorsey is so cerebral and so smart, I wonder if he tried to have Josh playing more cerebral, mm -hmm. which isn't necessarily a bad thing. But I maybe that kind of took him out of his play mm -hmm. style and out of that comfortability and Brady kind of just be like, nah, man, just go be Josh Allen. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And and we have seen that uh, yeah. be the case with Allen uh, so far. Some of these throws, yeah. some of the scrambles, like he's getting back to his normal self and you can mm -hmm. see it. And here's a, here's a big throw down the field. Second and two situation, uh, second quarter, 147 left in the half. Big 25-yard throw uh, to Gabe Davis. Awesome. We talked about the process and the eye manipulation. Again, working through it, scanning left, coming back, finding that deep half safety, and then manipulating him uh, mm -hmm. just enough to hold him there so that Gabe can uh, get up the sideline here. Look, a little pump right there. That holds him. You can see it, 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 it held that safety, and then boom, he's able to deliver the big throw down the field along the sideline to Gabe for 25 yards. We talk about this all the time, like for years, like when Alan does that little, that little shoulder shimmy or that little pump, it. that rig, mm -hmm. yeah, he's feeling yeah. it. He usually fires a dime right off of it. And yeah, I love, you know, the, the, the route concept with the two verticals, uh, affecting that split field safety. You get a really nice pocket, like you mm -hmm. highlighted there. So Alan has time. He's got, uh, the lanes and the windows for him to be able to sit and set and be comfortable. And then, yeah, you get that, uh, you know, bender in the middle of the field from Kincaid, which influences Kevin Byard, who's that split field safety to the bottom there. Like, he's kind of caught in no man's land. He's in a bind. Like, which one of these vertical routes do I have to play? Allen gives that slight pump like you said, to Kincaid, which makes Bayard hesitate enough. Boom, right there. He just takes that one little mm -hmm. step and then has to pivot back off that right foot. And by that time, he's given up 
too much space to Gabe Davis. And then also the ball placement at the end from Allen. Really good. Like I like how he throws him away from Byer. He doesn't lean Gabe into contact. He doesn't lean him too far upfield or give Byer the opportunity to make a play on the ball. He almost throws it like almost kind of back shoulders it to be like, mm-hmm. here you go. Let me protect you. Let me give you that space. Make a nice clean catch and we'll go forward. Yeah, and if you guys remember in the Broncos game, this is the same play that Diggs scored on that touchdown, right? It was Diggs down the bottom sideline, but it was versus cover three, I believe, right? Was mm-hmm. it Diggs that scored there? Yeah. Um, same concept. It's your certain was the one who got uh, yep. manipulated there. Yep, yep. He was uh, the deep third corner there. Um, this is a, a little different look, and to be honest, um, usually the two high beaters to the top of the screen, that little option route hole shot right here. Um, but Josh doesn't take it. Again, uh, you know, you can get away with these things when you have the big arm and he's able to find Gabe down the sideline for that that big gain. And it's it's one of those things where I swear when when it's a big game, big game, Gabe, he he shows up, man. He just shows up. He had a big game. Um, and, and it's not even just the plays where he got the target or he got the ball. Like he was open a lot in this game. He was open a lot. And it was good to see him put up some numbers, um, you know, in this game. So. Real quick, Eric, we got another super chat. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, Carl, appreciate you being here. Carl's a weekly regular viewer. Appreciate you being here, Carl, and thank you very much for the super chat. Carl says, JA17 is back. Ken Dorsey was the problem. Joe Brady is the solution. (laughs) The Bills played the best team in the NFL. Very tough. Playoffs if we win out. Dot, dot. A lot of statements there being made by Carl. I could see them literally running the table and going 11 and 6. I could also see them losing 4 out of 5 or all 5 if things go sideways. Like, it's... I'm stressed. Yeah, it's one of those seasons, man. Um, and, and yeah, it, it this could be the, you know, we talked about it a few games ago. We're like, maybe it's that second half Tampa Bay moment. Like maybe yeah. that's the case, you know, um, here. But again, with, with it happening so late in the season and the AFC being so, you know, stacked and so mm-hmm. many teams that and teams that the Bills have lost to when they shouldn't have. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just there's a lot of things stacked against this team. But you know what? I listen, I can enjoy football. I enjoyed football even during the drought years. Um, mm-hmm. we do things like this regardless. Even, you know, the, the games that we lose, like like this one, like there's still a lot of good in these games and in yes. this film. And I can get entertained even in a loss by looking at film like this. And you can find the good things yeah. even in the losses. And 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 that's why you're gonna we're, you're gonna be, deal with us regardless of how this team finishes the rest of the year. We're gonna be doing this regardless they win or lose. <laughs> Absolutely. And I'm already thinking like, hey man, if they don't make the playoffs, that sucks. But guess what? I'm gonna be a hundred percent ready for the senior bowl with all the teams yes, that I'm gonna be sir. grinding. So like yes. silver linings and everything. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right. So let's go to the end of this drive. Second quarter, 21 seconds left in the half, third and sixth situation, 13 yard touchdown to Diggs. And this is a play that the Bills have run a lot. You know, again, top of the screen, you got one, two, and then here comes three. But Josh, he he goes to four. He he goes to digs when he has three wide open. And this is one of those calculated risk type throws to digs. But he did a great job with the placement, keeping it low. Again, the the control and pace on this throw and the placement to keep it low to digs and digs scoops it up for the touchdown. I yelled at my TV in real time when this happened because I thought he missed Shakir as the number three coming over the middle. And I was furious. And then it ended up being a touchdown. And I forgot my fury and was just very happy. This, this throw is ridiculous. Like the placement Mm. and also like to like, let's give props to digs. Like that's a hard catch. You're making a sliding catch in traffic with buyer draped all over you. Like he's playing through digs to the ball. It's rainy. It's windy. Again, there's a lot of opportunities for one, this throw to go sideways for Josh Allen or just for digs not to be able to come down with this ball and look at where, so Zach Cunningham, no number 52, um, Mm -hmm where he's about to be like in that window and where Josh Allen places this ball away from him. It's just like, he's starting to get up field and Allen just leads it out in front to dig so that he clears Zach Cunningham and the ball gets placed perfectly. Like you said. Um, And then Eric, you know, I know you highlight and Connor McGovern there. You can see the Eagles kind of telegraph this two man game a little bit with Brandon Graham, like waiting for the spike so that he can loop around. And it's a good job from McGovern ID and that he gets his head on the man. Yeah. He sees what's going on, gets uh, his head on the man cuts over to the top of Dawkins and then just helps ride Graham outside a little bit to keep that lane nice and open for josh allen yeah that's that again that's a play speed play like your mid play here you feel that twist coming you see that defensive tackle looking at the dn and he's kind of playing off him like we talked about on the defensive side he's Mm -hmm. like okay is is dawkins with his at his level 
you know, he's obviously on another level. Is he going to pass that guy? You can't. And so he's like, okay, I'm going to stay on him. And they pick it up. And that that's incredibly important on this play because mm-hmm. that's the passing lane that Josh is able to use to throw it to Diggs for the uh, touchdown there. Just, just awesome stuff from Josh on that play. And kudos to Diggs to bring it up, uh, bring mm-hmm. it in there for the touchdown, six points. Huge play and uh, a moment that help you know give that bill give give that bills team a lead and a cushion and made us believe a little bit more just uh before we had our hearts ripped out and stomped all over <laughs> uh so i want to show this little sequence to uh you know we love play action we love play action from under center this was in the third quarter first and 10 situation um and, and you're gonna see this deep throw from dave uh, from allen to davis get a clearing route right here from Diggs, and then that deep crossing route um by uh, Davis there just a, a great work because this is a play they ran in the first quarter let me bring it from the other angle they ran this in uh, the first quarter and what happened was the uh, routes down the field by Davis and Diggs were congested and there's no way for Josh to uh, to get it to uh, Davis there so he kind of checked it down to Shakir but he missed Shakir completely in the flats as he peeled off like you see here um, but I like this adjustment by Brady because rather than having Diggs run this deep out route um, and then having that crossing route from Davis and all this congestion in that area right near the numbers, he said, you know what, let's just run the clear with, with Diggs. Mm-hmm. Get that guy out of there, run that deep crossing route, and then look, it's it's wide open. It's a, a nice throw from Josh for 23 yards. Yeah, it's beautiful. Diggs uh, clears Slay, pulls that deep third out, so it's just wide open for Gabe Davis on the cross. And uh, some good protection initially up front. Jordan Davis mm-hmm. starts to leak through a little bit, but at that point, uh, the routes have already developed downfield. So good job from the O-line kind of muddying things up and giving Allen enough time. Also, you know, shout boom. There you go. Shout out to James Cook a little bit on this Great. pass. Bro, he he had a nice uh he had a nice cut block on Zach Cunningham at a certain point in this game, earlier in this game. You know, he's again, he's always going to be kind of a work in progress when it comes to pass pro, but you're just looking for him to battle. You're looking for him just to do enough to be, you know, an obstructor to a blitzer so he reads Bayard picks him up does get knocked back and driven a little bit but he's able to do enough to give Josh Allen that great read man yeah this is a this is a high level read so when you your diagram in this play in the playbook it lets the the running back know hey if you're getting pressure off the edge as you see Bayard kind of creep down he has to call off the play fake so he calls it off and goes and meets him now he gets pushed back but again if he doesn't recognize this, Josh is blown up and he's not mm-hmm. able to stand in there and deliver this throw. So this is very good awareness from Cook and, and a good job of staying square against Bayard there to, to hold the line so Josh can push the ball down the field. And he's always been, even with you know his tape at Georgia when we broke down, like his issue really, he, he's got good awareness. Like he understands where to go. He recognizes what happens. It's just whether it's due to his size or the physicality, like he usually just struggles more at the block point than he does in the read. Um, But he's always been like pretty willing and good with his awareness. And, you know, again, that's a whole bunch of little things that work up front that allow uh, Allen to get to Gabe Davis. And here's the play, Eric, that you were talking about earlier, where this time, instead of running that clear from Diggs, you get the out, which leads to a little congestion, but it doesn't even matter because Allen checks it down early to Shakir, but uh, misses him down low. Yeah. See, and that's, that's the Brady adjustment, right? You know, it was a good Mm -hmm. job of coming out in the second half and running uh, that deep shot to Gabe there um, for that big gain. So those little things again, like that's not, this is, and that's been our whole thing with Brady, right, Eric? Like, it's not yeah. like he's revamped this offense, is doing all these things. No, it's these little tweaks, it's these little adjustments, it's a little bit of motion here, it's a change in personnel here, and all these little tiny. It's the opposite of what's happened for the defense. It's all these little positive <laughs> breadcrumbs yeah. that are leading to a bigger picture success. Right. And so here's a 29 yard gain to Cook, and this is really just vintage Allen under center play action, and he's he's you know got pressure in his face, and he's like, you know what, I'm gonna come all the way back across the field to Cook. And he's able to get up the field for 29 yards. I mean, you can't get the ball into Cook's hands enough, especially when we're talking uh, the receiving game. Good job of Josh of recognizing that pressure coming. Crazy, crazy ask of Gabe to come across here to pick up Mm -hmm. um, Bayard. That's that's nuts. That's nuts. And they've been doing some wild things with Gabe when it comes to blocking in the run game and obviously in the passing game. But good job of Allen just, again, sensing that pressure, finding that platform. Okay. Those guys down the field aren't open. Find your outlet. Found him. 29 yards later, there's Cook. Just awesome stuff uh, from, from Allen. I said it's vintage Allen. Like, that's literally him just backyard football, 
making something out of nothing. And I also like too that it kind of comes on like a sale concept that it turns into, which is like a concept that he is usually comfortable with and crushes. He, this time, not hitting the sale route, but just hitting that underneath piece. And I like what he does with his movement, like you highlighted. Like that's a that's a tough ask for Gabe Davis, but his pocket maneuverability almost kind of allows Gabe Davis to recover. Like he uses the positioning and leverage that Gabe Davis has to make him all, almost be like an effective blocker by stepping up into the side and stepping up. And then you get the block from Shakir yeah, immediately. Good yeah. Good work from Shakir downfield. This is also a really good catch from James cook. Like I know he dropped that one early uh, on the rail route. That would have been a touchdown, but again, in the rain and in the wind, this is, this is one off his frame. He has to extend. This is a really nice hands catch. And then with Shakir transitioning to a blocker, it almost functions like, like a design screen almost yeah. like Shakir is immediately ready. I, I love the awareness from Shakir here. He sees, and you can see it on the end zone angle. He sees Allen checking mm -hmm. this ball down to cook. And as soon as boom, he sees it right there. Look at where his head is. As soon snaps as he it. sees this, yep. As soon as he sees this ball checked down to cook, he immediately snaps his head around, gets his eyes on Roby and blocks him. Like, Shakir just makes so many of these little tiny heady plays and it's just impressive for a second year wide receiver. And that helped cook get even more yards on that play. All right. And this is the final breakdown of this uh, long in-depth uh, game against the Eagles. So third and 11 situation, 16 yard touchdown from Josh Allen. This is our easy loan auto sales, making it look easy. Allen is back play of the game. So <laughs> you see it to the top of the screen. Diggs is running the go route. To the bottom of the screen, Gabe Davis and Shakir are actually running the same exact play or route concept that Josh and Davis miss early or later in the game. Um, but Josh, <laughs> he ends up pulling it down versus the blitz and scrambling up the field and making Blankenship, the safety, miss for the touchdown. And you talked about Shakir on the last play and his awareness of turning into a blocker. Can we give some props to Dalton Kincaid? and getting into the play to help mm. Josh here. I mean, getting a piece of Bayard there, it's not much, but that effort goes a long way. And that he's very much like the way Josh used to talk about Singletary being the immaculate teammate, always picking guys up when they run the ball or catch the ball. Kincaid's that guy from the tight end position, man. This is great effort uh, from him down the field. Uh, we see this all the time. We saw it on the big play to Shakir. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, on that's, that big 81 yard. Yeah. So, yeah. uh, I, I love this play and it just, it felt good to see Josh, you know, run like this again and make a guy miss. Um, it was vintage Allen. He's definitely back and hopefully, you know, plays like this, um, can build his confidence back up for this run to end the year. Yeah. I want more Josh Allen, uh, on the ground from a scrambling perspective, like the, the, the spread offense that we're seeing. And if they can, if they can, even if it's just against a four man rush and he can leak out, like we saw multiple times in this game, or in this instance where it's a blitz and it gets blocked up and he pulls it down and runs like this is where for all the arm talent and what he can do with that bazooka attached to his shoulder, the difference that he really makes for me is with his legs, like that athleticism and, it's not just the athleticism, it's the maneuverability once he's in space. Like he can run through guys or he can shake him in the open field. Like this is a granted, this is a tough ask for Reed Blankenship, but he shakes him and then also runs through the arm tackle. So it it's the combination of that athleticism plus the size and frame and physicality. And um, you know, we talked about Joe Brady being, you know, how much would he lean into that spread aspect that he had uh, at LSU. And I think as he leans into it more, like it allows Josh Allen to be more weaponized with his legs from a scrambling perspective. Um, I also wanted to highlight Latavius Murray for his pass pro, mm -hmm. uh, in this one, he steps right up. IDs his man gets his hands on him, extends and just completely shepherds him and runs him right around the arc. Like it's beautiful. He keeps that B gap open. Look at that. Just runs him right around. Like that is tremendous pass pro from Latavius Murray. It's good hands. It's, it's textbook, Anthony. Absolutely. You're right. It's textbook. It's inside out. Like you want to take the inner half of that pass rusher. And like you said, that pride open that hole so that Josh could just get out the front door there. Yeah. Like you, that B gap bubble is always like worrisome from a scrambling perspective. And Murray keeps it open by running his man right through. And yeah. So tremendous job by Allen. Good job by Kincaid. Uh, Murray was my favorite. I, I feel like pass protection is such a dying or lost art 
in football today. So when I see a good one, I want to call it out. So shout out to Latavius Murray for that. Um, and this play in general being our making it look easy, easy loan auto sales, play of the game. Easy Loan Auto Sales, regardless of your credit situation, they can help you get behind the wheel and on the road to better credit. All their vehicles include a two-year, 24,000-mile warranty, and they have three convenient locations in Buffalo, Lockport, and Niagara Falls. They can get you driving today. Go to EasyLoanAuto.com to start your accelerated approval, and we have all their information in our episode show notes, whether here on YouTube or whichever podcasting app or platform you are listening to this show on. Also, I hate uh, Moro, number 41, clocking the hell out of digs on this play at the end. It kind yeah. of pisses me off, but I think it's incidental, but also. It's, it is. It, it's but you know what? But if yeah. I was an Eagles fan, I'd love it because I'd be like, good, take it to their best guy. Let them know you're going to be on them all game. That's one of those plays where <laughs> if you're on the opposite team, you hate it. But if you're a fan of that team, you love the grittiness and the sandpapery dirtiness yeah. of it. Like, yeah, fair point. Yeah, no, it was, uh, again, it was a fun breakdown. There was some uh, um, in-depth stuff that we had to look into when it comes to the defensive side of the ball. Um, I hope that helped you guys. Um, if you missed it, uh, get back to the beginning of the show. Look at some of the data that we presented. Look at some of the film um, that we presented um, during this bye week. It, it's something that uh, maybe you're not able to take all in at one sitting. So get back there, tell your friends about it, share everything. Um, I'm going to try to cut up some of that, those segments so that you guys can digest them in a shorter format. Um, but again, let everyone know what we got going on here. We put a lot of work into this. This is not easy to do on a couple days notice when it comes to the film, when it comes to the research, it takes a lot of uh, guys from our team when it comes to analytics. Thanks to, to Adam pencil for uh, helping us uh, with some of the numbers. Um, and, and again, a lot of work goes into this and, but we couldn't do any of this stuff if it wasn't out without you guys, you know, being here every single week, supporting us, engaging with us in the chat room was awesome tonight. Um, mm -hmm. but more importantly, if, if, you know, if this time of the year, if you, you want to help a, a small company like ours, become a one pass member, become an insider, um, at cover one football, just, uh, it was a fun episode, Anthony. It was, it was stressful getting ready for it. Cause there was a lot oh. to cover. I didn't know if we'd make it in time before Greg and Aaron come on, but um, it was well worth it. And I hope it was uh, a, a value to a bunch of the bills mafia. It was man. So the, the offensive film for this week. So, and for, to put in perspective for those, like we, we get the all 22 and it comes with three angles, the sideline and then both end zone angles this year, which has been awesome. And then depending on the game, all these things, it can take us just to go through like one side of the ball. You're looking at like a minimum usually of around like two hours, depending yeah. on like what you're looking for, what you're trying to do. The Bills offensive film this week was an hour and 20 minutes long. Like that's just without rewinding, yeah. doing anything. And then the defensive film was 59 minutes long. Yeah. When the, as soon as the, as soon as this game went to overtime, my first thought wasn't like, oh man, I hope the Bills win. My first thought was, oh, film's going to suck so this long. week. Yeah. And like you said it, like, it took so much to get through this film. And then on top of it, like we said, Eric, like we've said this before, we usually spend more time watching the film in the losses because mm -hmm. we're trying to diagram what's going wrong and then also put together those potential solutions. And man, like what we, everything that went into this episode, especially because of what we were doing from a detective work standpoint mm -hmm. on the defensive side of the ball. Yeah, man. Like it's, I feel like my eyes are ready to bleed because I've done nothing but film these past two days, like getting ready for this episode. And like you said, I, I hope everyone found value in it. It was, um, the juice was worth the squeeze for us when we see like what, what how everything comes to fruition. And like we said, like, this is an important piece. This bills team goes into the bye week at six and six and, They've got some things to lean into that they can hopefully continue that can help them win. Um, but they've also got some pieces to clean up going forward. And, you know, Eric, that's going to be a hugely important piece. Um, so as you know, whatever you got, anything in your head right now, looking forward, coming out of this game, uh, what's your thought process when it comes to going into this bye week? Are you looking for anything in particular? Or are you just thinking large scale? What's in your mind right now as the Bills head into the bye? Um, a break. Take a little break. Like we, that again, this episode was draining. Um, the first 12 weeks have been an up and down roller coaster. So I think I step away for a few days, take a few days off. Um, and then, you know, maybe this weekend examine something that I want to look into about this team, um, uh, going forward. So we'll see. I, I'll, I'll conjure up something as far as content goes. Um, and stay tuned for next week's episode. We'll figure out something that we can, uh, dive mm -hmm. into. It's funny because, it feels like anytime we play the chiefs, we have like extra time to prepare for them. And we end up 
funny. Usually doing a scouting episode, oh. which is not something we do. I do a lot of when it comes to the film room, because again, it takes a lot to, to get into that. Um, but maybe that is something that we could approach for next week's show. Um, that is if we don't have a special guest on Wednesday of next week. So I'm still mm. waiting on that, on that mm. call back um, mm. from someone that uh, we talked about last week in the film room uh, that wears a gold jacket. So um, mm. something with that is in the works. Uh, we'll see uh, how that unfolds and if that schedule of his uh, matches up with ours. Yeah, that would be awesome if we can uh, bring that to the light and bring that to fruition as we yeah continue on this road of diagramming anything and everything and diagnosing anything and everything that has to do with the Buffalo Bills. I'm similar to you. I'm going to kind of unplug for a little bit. I'm still recovering from Thanksgiving last week <laughs> and then the emotions of this game and all this tape. I'm excited to watch some AEW Dynamite tonight and just chill I don't know what that out. is. It's wrestling. You would, oh, but it's a oh. good time. So it would be good. There's a lot of good matches. Jay White versus Swerve Strickland. I know Eric, you're super pumped for it. I know you yes. love Jay White. Yeah, you're all about it. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm super pumped for that. I'm gonna kind of detach for a little bit and then get yeah. right back at it. You know, bye week stuff. Um, but like you said, we've man got a hell of a gauntlet for this team with the Chiefs and the Cowboys and the Chargers and the Pats and the Dolphins and. It looks bleak, but the opportunity is still there for this team to prove themselves and go into the playoffs. And, you know, hell, not to be that silver linings kind of guy, but if the Bills win five straight and they go into the playoffs at 11 and six, this could be that team that everyone's talking about that nobody wants to play. If they can start to course mm -hmm. correct some things, who knows? Maybe some players potentially come back from injury and we'll see what happens. But either way, we will have you covered every single week here live every Wednesday, 7 p.m. Eastern in the film room for anything and everything that you need to know with the Buffalo Bills. Yes, RJ gets it. He says, that Jay White versus Swerve match is going to be insane. Yeah, Eric is all about it too. Look how yeah. happy he is to talk about it. How dare you? How <laughs> dare you? But yeah, it's going to be a good rest of the night. We appreciate you folks for stopping in and joining us live here on this episode. We know bi week stuff combined with losses, sometimes people don't want to consume anything or do anything. So we're very thankful and grateful for everybody who joined us live in this episode tonight. Thank you very much to Bills Witch, Kevin G, Brad Duell, and Carl Tommen for your super chat donations yeah, tonight. You. We greatly appreciate it. Um, before anybody leaves, please, 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 thank you. Drop a like on this video. It goes a long way towards helping us to track and trend in front of more eyes and ears. If you are watching later here on YouTube, that's cool as well. Please drop a like on this video. If you are listening on any of the podcasting apps or platforms, please rate and review and subscribe to the Cover One Film Room and subscribe to the Cover One channel as a whole. We have you covered every single day of the week when it comes to anything and everything Buffalo Bills, varying levels of analysis, depending on what you're looking for. We've got you covered here on this brand. And yeah, we hope to be that resource for you going forward as the Bills look to push for the playoffs and potentially save this season. But like Eric said earlier, regardless of what happens, if we're continuing analysis into the playoffs, if not, and we're moving that focus towards free agency and scouting and everything for the draft, we will have you covered here every single week in the cover one phone for anything and everything you need to know when it comes to the X's and O's of the Buffalo Bills. But that'll do it for us here in this episode of the film room. We hope you and your family and friends and loved ones are all doing well and staying safe. Be kind to one another, take care of one another, tell your family and friends and loved ones about how awesome this show is. We appreciate the support that we get from you folks in every form and fashion that it comes in. But for myself, Anthony Prohaska for Mr. Eric Turner, this has been another episode of the cover one film room. We will see you next Wednesday, 7 PM Eastern with potentially something special, but until then Godspeed. And as always go bills. <laughs>